Hello again and welcome to the Matt Black Podcast. We're on to episode seven and I've got Miranda Arie with me here today. How are you? I am very good. Thank you very much. How good. are you? I'm very good, yes. Uh, happy that I got your name correct as well. You really did. They, they yeah. don't normally do that. <laughs> they, don't, <laughs> they don't normally do that. <laughs> Right, so you've travelled over from, is it Leeds? I have correct? indeed. It's been a lovely scenic route here to Barnsley. Thanks very much. <laughs> Do you come to Barnsley often? I don't actually, no, but I, I, every time I have come, I've really enjoyed it actually, so yeah. Right. I, I haven't been out on the town here yet though, I don't know what that's like. It's not the same as it used to be. No. Uh, it looks nicer, but it's not got that wildness that, although... The feral, I, the feral sort of category. Yeah, I it, I don't really need the wild anymore. I'm tired and older. I don't yeah. <laughs> I mean, I went out the other week and got them to turn the volume down in the bar I was in. So that's where I'm at in my life. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right. So I've got a bit of a list here of uh, the multiple things that you do. Um, oh, yeah. Remind me, please. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I may have missed some. So uh, for the ones that don't know, Miranda's a motivational speaker and coach. Yes. Uh you, I don't know how long you've been doing this, but you've, I've seen you've been recently working as a BBC radio presenter I for have Leeds. have indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a bit of a turn up for the books, yeah. Yes, uh, you're also a singer-songwriter, I've seen you've been doing lots of musical ventures along the way, uh, and you're the founder of the NHS Heroes programme. That's correct, what? yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, so HEROES stands for Healing, Education and Recovery of Emotional Strength. And it's an eight-week, 20-hour group work program. Uh, so we have like up to eight people in a group and we guide them through week by week uh, just different topics to support them with their emotional recovery, with their mental health recovery, trauma recovery. So we have a lot of people in the groups who have experienced trauma in childhood in particular. Um, down to people who are also just encountering work stress or whatever, whatever they come with, self-defined uh, mental health difficulties. We just guide them through a journey really of, of recovery, looking at um, a really holistic approach, a really trauma-informed and holistic approach to recovery um, with a core theme of self-compassionate practice running through it and looking at identity and releasing limiting beliefs um, that, that are causing people to be stuck in their lives and managing change in that way. So it's been it's been really uh, one, one of my favourite projects I've ever ever created in my life, really. Right. As a, is that, was that your creation or did someone come on board with you with that or...? Do you have a little I tea created now, it or? myself uh, <laughs> in lockdown, actually. Like, so I just ended up getting <laughs> launched into um, a role as network mental health lead about about three weeks before the first lockdown hit um, in the NHS. I'd never worked in the NHS in my life. And my only brief was create something for people with mental health problems. So when lockdown hit, I started like going on the phones. I was coaching loads of people um, through the difficulties they were having at that time. And one of the core themes that was really coming out for a lot of people was that they were really struggling with the isolation aspects. You know, for good mental health, we really need human connection. Yeah. And a lot of people were struggling with that. So I just thought, right, do you know what? I am going to bring people together in groups. Um, even though, obviously, it was lockdown, we did it in a safe way, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I started bringing people together and I just started trialing out materials, trialing out stuff with them that had helped me on my own recovery journey and um, through, you know, recovering through trauma myself from my childhood and mental health difficulties that I'd struggled with my whole life, really. Um, over the years, I've been able to find and research and study tools that have really supported me in my recovery journey. So I started just bringing them to people in the NHS and it just evolved and evolved and evolved through all these. I was running countless workshops and it just evolved into an eight week program. So it was it's a bit of a miracle, really. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it, it's been really incredible. And I've got an amazing, amazing team uh, now. And yeah, one of one of my teammates, uh, Sarah Wadsworth, really supported with the uh, with the piloting stages of of Heroes, and now she's like a core part of the team, which is really really beautiful. It's, it's beautiful working with your friends, yeah. you know. It, it's really been uh, a, a blessing for me. It's come around at the right time as well, because I imagine people, especially in the last few years, struggling more than ever yeah. with the the challenges that they've been facing. So. Um, what is the next step for that? Would it, are you thinking of kind of taking that any further, like outside of the area, or is is it 
are you kind of really busy at the moment at where you are? <laughs> it's pretty busy. It's pretty busy. So we're in two different primary care networks in Leeds at the moment. So we're, we're covering we're covering 20-something GP surgeries. So for patients wow. across 20-something, 20, 20 I can't remember exactly how many of the two primary care networks, across Leeds. And we're steadily expanding through the NHS in that way. We're also contracted into a... Um, a housing association, Beacon Housing. So I've been going in and training up other people to become facilitators of heroes. So working that sort of uh, franchise way, I guess. And yeah, we plan to expand as, as far and wide as possible because we're having such groundbreaking outcomes with people. You know, people who've been through the mental health services for 20 years, some of them, and they've never really been able to achieve the goals or the outcomes. And, you know, we have people by week five or six going oh my god I've reached my goal already you know we've had such incredible transformations it's really uh, vibing me up with a really strong will to want to spread it um, as far and wide as possible really and in whichever way uh, in whichever way that's possible um, having fun along the way which I believe is the key to success <laughs> oh yeah you've, got to, you've got to keep smiling <laughs> it really yeah and you know that high vibe energy is what brings the momentum to actually support us to achieve our own goals you know staying in that energy not of you know there's the, 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 a lot of us like when we look at goals or things we want to achieve we get into the mindset of what can I get? Or we, 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 we internalize it. We make it about ourselves quite a lot of the time. It's just human nature. We do. How will I look in this? What if I'm judged? But when you step out of that and go, okay, what can I give? How can I be of service to this world? And how can I have fun along the way doing that? I mean, the dynamo, dynamo just gets going. It's a catalyst for expansion and growth and success. So really going in with that energy um, and using the teachings that we're, that we're bringing through in the program to actually expand it it's it's I'm learning a lot <laughs> I'm learning a lot I feel like I've learned so much in the last five minutes already yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no it's um it's a lot easier said than done isn't it and oh you know God, you, yeah. you can kind of put out a pathway for someone but it's never simple and it's never always the same for each individual person um yeah. just based on the things that they've gone through as well it's it, it's very kind of unique to each person um, it really is. I've I found with a lot of people that I, I've been ar spent time around who, the ones that are more kind of open about where they've come from, the background and what they've been through, um, some people just seem to be able to handle things a lot easier than others. And then other, others, the tiniest thing could really set them down a path to devastation. Yeah. Um, so you're, I've seen online, you're quite open about your background and uh, the things that you've been through and I'm I'm gonna guess that's what is the reason to, for you having that drive towards helping others usually a lot of people do seem to do that they, they go through something quite difficult themselves and then decide actually I'd like to stop other people feeling that way in the future absolutely it's been like my biggest mission in my heart because because of the amount of suffering I've been through and do you know what I want to make it very clear because I feel like it's very important and um, that that I am one of those people that feels everything very deeply and goes through a lot of distress in my own emotions way less than I used to, <laughs> way less than I used to. But recovery is not an end point to get to. Recovery is not a place where we're suddenly healed and we don't feel stress or pain anymore. Recovery is that journey. And I'm in recovery. And, you know, and and that's the way I think it's important to look at it. And we are in recovery the second that we decide to affirm I am in recovery. And it's very important for people to remember that. It's not a linear process. And I guess that part of that healing starts when we become very aware of those stories that we've created about ourselves in childhood or as a response to difficult situations in our lives. When we're very aware of what we're dealing with, when we're aware of, you know, our fears, we become very familiar with what we're afraid of. We become very familiar with the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and we become very, very familiar with the beliefs we've created about who we are in our own identity, when we become familiar with that voice and we expose it and go, oh my God, I've been telling myself for the past 20 years, nobody likes me. I'm not lovable the way I am. I have to pretend I'm something different to be accepted. When we start exposing all this stuff 
and and you know we do it in heroes uh, every week we do it exposing this stuff when we start to see it that's the moment that we can do something about it because otherwise this stuff stays very hidden yeah and sadly those beliefs are what drive our actions that we take the partner that we pick, the job we decide to go into, where we go on a night out, whether we ask them to change, turn the music (laughs) down or not or whatever, you know. So our beliefs about who we are dictate every choice we make in our lives. So exposing that and picking apart those beliefs and starting to shift them is the most powerful thing we can do. And that's the only reason I'm able to do what I do or the suffering, the suffering did used to just completely stop me in my tracks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm kind of relating to a lot of things there already, just thinking about past choices. Uh, yeah. I've been very open to anyone that's ever kind of followed anything I've done um, about kind of the struggles I've had in the past. Yeah. And um, and I don't think I really helped myself, really. Uh, when I look back, I reflect on the situations and how I've handled things, the things that I've done or the things that I've said or or you know, like you said, partner choices, some people they go back to people when they know that it's not the right thing for them. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's like fear of being alone or it's just the comfort of knowing that it's the same as before, but forgetting about all the bad things, you know, there's Absolutely. there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of that kind of spinning through my head right now. I'm, I'm the constant worry of all that type of stuff as well. And 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 being a musician myself, I'm, I'm always kind of worrying about, well, not so much now, but like I say, like, what people think oh if i did that would what would people think if i did that and should i do it a certain way even though it's not the way i want to do it yes. and you kind of restrict yourself because yeah you're worried about what other people are thinking as i've got older it's kind of a little bit more like water off a duck's back but it's not completely gone away but maybe it is that as you say there is no end point you just kind of learn to just get on with things and manage things in your own personal way absolutely and i think the most powerful thing particularly when we're talking about creativity is the most powerful energy we can bring forward is our complete authenticity our complete authentic selves so when we're trying to modify ourselves in these certain ways to fit into these certain categories or maybe these people will like me more if i do this we lose the 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 most powerful energy we have to communicate an idea, to communicate a thought or to communicate a creative emotion, you know, particularly through music, you know, or the arts in that way. If we go into that going, right, I'm going to create something that these people will like or they'll think this of me or they at, at least they won't think this of me if I don't do this, we don't create something that communicates with our people. Yeah. The people who are really going to love us for who we are. And that's going to require that we become very comfortable with people not liking us. Yeah. And that's very challenging, isn't it? Oh, you definitely. <laughs> I, I, I kind of, inside, I'm, I feel myself applauding people when they're walking down the street dressed like what to what a point where people would almost describe them as ridiculous looking. Yeah. And I just think, <laughs> you know, if people... If people did that to Lady Gaga stood in the post office, she she may never have created the things that she's you know come up with. And I just think it's <laughs> it's just really weird how we people just kind of jump on everyone straight away, and it kind of stamps out any kind of almost uniqueness about them. It's yes. I feel like schools very much are like that, where they stop people. You can't have a blue streak in your hair or a, an earring. School's or, got a lot to answer for. I think so. In, in, <laughs> in, in beating out the authenticity of us, because we've, we've, with, with the, within the school system, we're all funneled through one certain path, but people are not that. <laughs> you know, mm. we're all so unique. We need different areas that we that we thrive in. We need different. We're all different categories of people, different things make us tick. So when we're forced to all be ticked through the same boxes and pitched, you know, in competition with each other. And, you know, it's like that age old saying, which is um, insanity is, um, you know, uh, judging a fish on its ability to climb a tree. Yeah. We like that as kids in school, aren't we? We're very much tested on different things that are in a funneled system and it doesn't bring forward our amazing power and qualities and creativity a lot of the time you know yeah if you're a maths wizard it might be great i'm not (laughs) (laughs) neither am i (laughs) that's why i hated school there's two of us here i know that (laughs) but yeah it's um i just kind of thought when i was like leaving school they 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 would just drive you to you either 
they, they will very quickly separate you. These are the ones that are probably going to go to university. You lot can just load stuff onto vans, and and that's <laughs> and that's how it kind of went. And I was, uh, I feel like I was kind of one that dipped between, um, but I didn't try hard enough. But yeah. I think it's because I was rebelling by the fact that the any time I wanted to be slightly entertaining or artistic, they just kind of restricted it, stamped it out. I didn't, I, you, you know, when you get to the point in school where you can choose certain yeah. um, lessons that you want. So it was, you go down, uh, I think it was art or music or drama. Um, as much as I love to act the goat, I'm, I'm not really, I don't think I've ever acted in my life, in, you know, so I thought I'll not do that. I was all right at drawing, so I thought, great, I'll do that. But there was music and I obviously, I was, oh, I'm really getting into this. But I hated everything that they were teaching me and the way that it was done. And I thought, I can just learn so much more off the internet from people Absolutely. who are just, like you said, just being themselves and teaching me in a way that I understand. Absolutely. And it's a real challenge, isn't it? Because I think that the way that creativity is taught in the schools a lot of the time is like, it's not just go write a song. Go write a song, go be creative. It's like, write a song within this brief. Analyze the song. Tell me the theory behind this song. Make sure you annotate it correctly. And it's like, it, it crushes. It's like shoving your creativity through a steamroller when you're forced to analyze, you know, pieces of music, art. You know, great if people enjoy that and have a passion for it. Fantastic. Do that till the cow, cows come home if you want. But that is not supporting creativity. So no. we cannot class those kind of lessons within school as creative subjects anymore. Yeah, I don't think um, Pink Floyd would have been analysing oh. Dark Side of the Moon while they were <laughs> completely off the nut on whatever was around at the time. So Exactly. Yeah, it, it just seems to come from anywhere. You know, like most musicians that I speak to, when I talk about writing and the way that they approach things, um, it always seems to come from somewhere different. And, and, and I think that's, I mean, don't get me wrong, there are people that they, they will kind of go down the same the same foundations for a song, but then it, it's, I don't know, it's, this is a really weird one to talk about, but it's like some people, they, they, they'll just see something and it just sets them yes. off thinking about something. And it may not even be completely related to what they've just seen, but it's just triggered something else in their mind from years ago or yeah. something that they've seen or something that they've just decided all of a sudden, actually, I feel quite strongly about this. I need to get this out onto paper. Absolutely, yeah. And, and a lot of the time, that's what I love about writing songs, that a lot of the time you don't know where it comes from. I've written some of my best songs, like Driving Along, it's been completely silent, and I've just had, got a hook in my head. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's not a song I know. And then I'll go home or I'll record it into my voice recorder and then just go slam it out on the piano, you know, and be like, you know, it, I haven't sat down to try and write a song. In fact, I've never done that. Mm. You know, I, I, it, the, the songs come through and it is and it is that sort of divine inspiration, isn't it? And I guess that that's why authenticity is such a huge part of it because that flow cannot come through if we're abandoning ourselves or trying to modify ourselves. That that creative flow cannot come through unless we're in a place where we're allowing it, allowing ourselves to feel, you know, and that is what people resonate with when they listen to music. It makes them feel something yeah. with all the arts. We, we don't want something, you know, that just is, is stony. We, we like art and music that makes us feel something don't we? So when yeah. we bring our true feelings into that art and we don't try and modify it, we 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 push out that true authenticity. That is what connects. Yeah. I think um that's that for me is like when I hear kind of computer generated music. Yeah. It's all right for five, ten minutes for me. <laughs> I I can enjoy it for what it is, but then after a while I'm thinking I need something a bit I need some raw emotion in here. I need yeah. I need a a singer, a songwriter that's lived <laughs> through something. Absolutely. I always absolutely. love when a singing voice is kind of gruff as they've got older. And I think that's a voice that's been, that's been around. Tom Waits. It's been around, yeah. <laughs> God, absolutely. You know, there's, there's a Beethoven quote, quote, which I love. And the quote is, to play a wrong note is insignificant, but to play without passion 
is inexcusable. Oh, yes. I've heard that. And I love that so much because sometimes you'll go and see an artist perform and they might be getting everything right and they're musically absolutely perfect, hitting every note, but you feel nothing and you can't connect. All you can do is go, wow, they're really good at the guitar. Wow, they're really a good singer, but there's nothing that's connecting and you might get a bit bored even. Whereas sometimes I've seen a a, a friend of mine actually uh, in particular has come into mind. She's called Keeper of Bees, Vicky Whelan, absolutely incredible uh, singer-songwriter. Um, and, and, you know, I, mem- I remember a time when I saw her at Seven Arts when this quote really, I was like, wow, this is it. This is it. She was shaking. She was terrified. She was making wrong notes even. Not mm. not many, you know, but 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 that passion was so powerful in that room that you were hooked. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's that passion that comes through, the energy of someone really being present with that music. Um, and that is, that's what we connect with as human beings and we need more of that. Yeah. I've seen some some very high-end bands in big places just kind of going through the motions. And they may have, like you say, they've, they've played all, you know, um, they've played all the right notes, all in the right order, but they've um, they've just not really putting anything into it and then you've seen bands that are playing they're in the zone they're playing everything with conviction there's so much passion yeah and they you can almost see the the veins sticking out of them you know there's there's there's, they're just completely throwing everything they've got into it and it just makes your hair stand on end and you just get kind of you know you start getting a shiver you're like oh my god this is amazing and that's what music's about to me and i i just i I i love when i can see a show like that because i'm guessing if a band does a 60 day tour not every single show is going to be like that because they might be hung over they might be tired yeah you know (laughs) if you've caught that right one at that moment i think you're you're very lucky as a fan to be in in that in that in that room as that's happening absolutely and that feeling if you're performing and you're really present nothing quite like that so let's talk about your music then. So when did uh, your musical journey start? What age? What what did you see that lit that fire? Well, when I, when I first picked up a guitar properly when I was in mental hospital, when I was a teenager. So I was about 14 years old. Mm. I was living in Hyroid's uh, mental hospital at the adolescent unit there called Linton House. And there was like an old broken guitar. I was really heavily into like rock music at the time, grunge, you know. Um, I ha- they took my Kirk Cobain posters down. I had Richie Edwards <laughs> up on the wall because it was influencing people, in inverted commas. And, you know, I was really, really getting into proper music like I call that proper music yeah. you know so I was very attracted to this guitar it was a one string guitar oh God. NHS yeah. <laughs> this old bad classical it's always a classical yeah yeah a classical two, two nylon strings on it absolutely <laughs> hurts your fingers last um, but I managed to write a song on this one string on this guitar I still remember it now exactly mm. uh uh you know a four note song I would say four chord but it was four note yeah. song <laughs> On this guitar, um, it was a song called Keep Me. And it was about it was about feeling mad, actually, at the time as well. And I remember writing that and being addicted to, write, to, to playing that song again and again and again because of the feeling that I got from it was that I was able to put into that song words that I could not speak, an expression of how I was feeling and where I was at in my life that I would not have been able to say, but I was able to put it in the song yeah. and make it into something quite beautiful to me that felt beautiful to me. And I remember after first writing, it was a real high. And like I say, I would just play it again and again and again, that song. Um, and yeah, and then obviously got out of the nut house, classic thing to do, joined a punk band yeah. and, and started <laughs> collaborating with the guys in the band and just writing a lot from there, picked up a bass, you know, uh, because it, the one string guitar, I had yeah. to go to bass, obviously. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. More than one string is quite yeah, overwhelming. I'm quite experienced at playing one note at a time. <laughs> it's, it's, I really like playing just one note at a time. Uh, yeah, so, and, and it just went from there. And, I, you know, I still use it therapeutically. And the funny thing is, it's like, it's very rare I write a song when I'm feeling ha- happy or... Um, not all my songs are miserable. My songs mm. can sound quite happy, you know, in themselves. But 
I write when I need to process something and it's not something I'll sit down and force myself to do, but it's something that definitely comes through. And, you know, I do believe it has been a cope for me, but one of the most beautiful uh, things, life-saving things for me, actually, you know, mm. to be able to put how I feel into music. Yeah, it's quite therapeutic to just, <sighs> it's, you feel like you're offloading, don't you? It's the same way when kind of, Therapists will say, oh, write down all your bad feelings and then yes. we'll burn the piece of paper or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm the exact same and I've mentioned this on a previous episode. I, I don't think I've ever actually written a happy song in my entire life. I always, it's when I've kind of just gone, oh, and I'm like, oh no, I'm feeling a certain way. Oh, suddenly I've got this idea. Oh, I need to write this down. And I'm yes. thinking about all these things. And so to me, they all... They, might be absolute nonsense to everybody else but to me it feels really profound at the time and 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 I think well I, I know I'm not the only one that feels like this hell yeah. I know this now hell yeah a long time ago I didn't so I wouldn't write things down I, I feel like I've missed out on quite a lot of years of output. good song fodder yeah because <laughs> I, I thought I can't write this it's too dark but as time's this gone on it. I'm like just get it out and again I don't really care what people think they think oh he's bit he's, he's miserable or he's uh you know it sounds like he's writing songs for the smiths or whatever because they're always a bit miserable <laughs> well they've done they? all right for yeah. themselves aren't yeah. they so, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not faulted them yeah i'm sure they didn't care what people thought well exactly well morrissey definitely doesn't does he oh no no <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he gives a crap what people think about him yeah and it's funny isn't it because it, with with music as well it's not always that we're directly writing i am feeling sad etc yeah. etc et it's sometimes just um, playing with that it, it, and this idea of playing with it, you know, uh, sometimes even writing th that people might not even be able to tell the way you feel from it. It's not always a direct communication, is it? Our yeah. creativity is not always just like uh, black and white direct communication, but it's this energy of of playing with that feeling and turning it into something beautiful and and I guess that that's what we can do with our emotions as well. Like whether we are a musician or a creator or not, it's this idea of of taking the difficult times in our lives, the difficult emotions that we feel and turning them into something that is a dynamo, that is a catalyst, feeling the fear, doing it anyway, using the fear, using the pain to drive us forward. And we all have the power to do that, even if you're at home or wherever you are right now listening. Like, how will, how can I do that? I'm on my knees with suffering. We all have that capability within us as human beings. We're yeah. all alchemists and, and alchemy means taking the dirt and making it into gold. It's a scientific term. It's, that's about as, as scientific as I get. Yeah. <laughs> but taking that dirt, making it into gold, we do that very well through music. We create something beautiful. You know, we're feeling low and we write a song. We can create something beautiful out of that. We can do that even if we're not a creative in inverted commas because we are all creators as human beings and we can start to frame those difficult times and those difficult feelings okay what about if I see this as my friend what about if I befriend this fear what is it teaching me what is it showing me where can it get me it's a strong energy is fear how can I use it to push me forward how can I befriend it to to go through this process of, of alchemy uh, which we every single human being is here to do I yeah. believe really from, from the bottom of my heart I believe that and um, and the more that we start to do that the more we start to expand in this life and the more we start to grow in this life and achieve the things that we want to do um, so feeling the fear and doing it anyway it's very powerful yeah see I I, I think it was maybe around 2018 I kind of had this almost like a felt like a rebirth to me because I'd gone through a really darker time, very chaotic, yeah. kind of living a reverse weekend, playing shows and then treating four or five days a week like it was the weekend, going to sleep at four. Oh, I hear you on that, yeah. Missing the daylight, all that type of stuff. All things, you know, with the, with, with the like I said, kind of being a bit of a, a night prowler, just partying and just being an absolute idiot and uh, not really remembering why I would wake up the next day and someone might not be talking to you and things like that because oh, you just yeah. couldn't even remember what had gone yeah. on in, in your evening um and I and I, I got to a point where I thought I can't keep going like this because we've uh the amount of alcohol I'm drinking is gonna mm -hmm. 
completely delete me or I'm going to do, I'm going to go down a path myself doing something like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I started to try and make a change and I was like, weren't happy in the relationship I was in at the time. I didn't want to live where I lived. I didn't want to be doing certain things in the bands I were in and all that type of stuff. Uh, and the career so I just changed it all um, yeah. and it was terrifying because I was like oh my god I've just plucked myself out of the uh, out of the little like casino machine <laughs> out the arcade yeah. and just plonked myself somewhere completely new uh, all unknown territory yes. and I don't know if it always works out for everybody but it worked out better for me because Incredible. I was like oh my god I'm, I feel calmer, I'm away from the drama, I feel healthier, this and that, blah, blah, That's blah. That's a song, calmer away from the drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, um, and and at the time, it's like you were talking about the, uh, like, feeling the fear of something and doing it anyway. I was I was writing a song about just kind of my situation in my life at the time, and I thought, God, this is like 20 times the length of Bohemian Rhapsody. I can't make this into a song. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do with it? So I thought, well, maybe I'll put it into a blog or something. I thought, no, I'm not really a kind of blog guy because this is probably going to be a one-off. I'm not going to keep doing this, so it'll yeah. be a waste of time. So I started putting it into a book, and I put it into a little book that I put out. Incredible. And it had got lots of personal information on it. Uh, and then when I pressed the button for it to go and be available on Amazon, I was like, oh, my God. I like the The anxiety I was feeling at that time people probably i just posted it on my facebook and and said this is you know this is now That's available incredible and every, i'll give that a read everybody all thought that i was probably like really excited and happy about it partly was but i was actually more terrified of like oh my god i've just put all this crap out of my head that's <laughs> that's not not just a made-up song about someone someone else's situation yes. this is all 100 percent about me yeah. and my own struggles but thankfully i had loads of people contact me kind of sharing their own stories Gorgeous. things they've been through some people said it was helpful for them i imagine it weren't in depth enough for some people you know in terms of like the the things i do to try and like manage my own mental health but it seemed to it seemed to have a positive kind of response so i was quite relieved but even then that's like i was there like finger over the over the button yes. ready to press it thinking oh my god you know, I've like I've spent all this time writing it. I've put it all together. I've paid for an editor. I've done all this stuff. I've got it all ready, and and then I was like, oh, do I actually press this button? And I Beautiful. thought it, it was terrifying. <laughs> it was like one of it's the most so terrifying, brave. one it's of the so, most terrifying yeah, things I've ever done. <laughs> it is, and and we're always going to feel that biggest fear when we're on the big brink of a breakthrough. We really, really are, and it's so courageous what you did. You know, it's so courageous for us to share our stories. It's so courageous for us to be vulnerable. So when people frame vulnerability as weakness, mm. I can't get my head around that because the more vulnerable we are, the stronger we are. It means the braver we are. You yeah. know, it, feeling that fear, doing it anyway, to, to step out of our comfort zone is so courageous. To share how we feel is so courageous. The, the 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 bravery that that takes for us to actually share how we feel authentically in a moment, you know, and go against what our fear-based thought system might be telling us, it takes so much strength. Uh, so to start framing that vulnerability as as wow you know what a strength what a power it's so important because we need people's vulnerability in this world because people do resonate like you say yeah i uh, i found it like kind of just letting the walls down at that, at that time and then yeah. I've, not only were i letting people in but i was freeing myself at the same time so like Incredible. i can i can i'm not stuck in this place now terrified of what everyone else thinks i can just get out I've, I've kind of felt like I'd, I'd explain myself uh in for things that I may have done or said in the past and also give people a good understanding of um like why I am the way I am right now <laughs> for, for the ones that might care you know that type yeah. of thing because I, I didn't do it as a kind of like how to guide it was it was it was called it was like a how to not do it basically based on my own <laughs> mistakes how to yeah, not yeah, to guide. Yeah, yeah this is actually in capitals on it but it's um but yeah uh, 
I'm sure I might even have a copy in in I the would attic. I'd love to read so it. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll have a look when we fi- when we finish this. <laughs> you can have a little nosy. Absolutely nosey. incredible. <laughs> and what you said there about this idea of freedom, this liberation that occurred as you released that, as you shared your own story, as you shared your own struggles. It is like freeing yourself from a mental prison. And a lot of people don't realize a lot of the time, people frame so much of the time in this life, you know, that their struggles are because of their difficult life circumstance or because of what happened to them in the past. Yeah. Everything there is valid. The pain that we've experienced is real. The things that happened to us have happened to us. However, the liberation that occurs when we recognize that we have that choice to break through that fear and start changing our internal world and releasing those fear-based thoughts and then recognizing that that's what changes our external circumstance. Because if we forever put ourselves in the mental prison of waiting for things to change and get better before I make that move, before I press that button and release my story, before I do that courageous step, well, when this happens, I'll do it. We will forever be in that prison. Yeah. We'll forever be in that prison. So so this, this, these steps that we take where we recognize we don't need to get rid of the fear and we do it with the fear, that's how we teach the fear that it's not telling us the truth. That's yeah. the way we do it. We, 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 we have to do it with the fear because we do not, I, I, I don't want to get morbid, but some people sometimes need something shocking them into it. We yeah. don't want to get to 90 laying on our deathbed going, fuck what if i'd hit that button yeah yeah what what if i'd published that book what if i'd released that song that i was so scared what people were gonna think go 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 share your gift shine your light screw what other people think feel the fear hear the fear oh my god people are gonna think i'm an idiot comfort that part of you and go yeah. You have the power. You do not have to wait for the external life circumstance to change. And when you do it and you shift that internal world, your life circumstance will change. The external world you will see will change according to that. Yeah. No, it's um, even like, because when I put that out there, I thought, well, I hope people take something away from it. But yeah. when I look back now, if it had have sold no copies, mm-hmm. I would not be worried right now because I thought it's so it's it's completely changed me just getting incredible like like i just felt like i'd just got a rucksack full of bricks on my back and it's just i've just cut, thrown it behind me and, I, and it's somewhere in the distance now so and healing it, oh it's amazing so healing because i know that people find that we have, we talked about with, with songs and things like that but to to do it on you know, on, a, on a level where there's like Thirty thousand plus words in there. It was uh, How incredible. it was like monstrous in my mind. To somebody else, it might just they're probably an outsider looking in, just thinking, "Well, it's just it's just a book." But I thought this is just like I mean, it's not even. It was just some significant points in my life. It wasn't everything. It's not like I thought, "Oh, I'll just write a biography," you know, autobiography yeah. or something like that. I just I just used what I thought were relevant points for those you know those situations and. It's it just it worked for me anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying I've just come out of it. And I'm like hallelujah! I feel amazing now, and I'm and I, everything's perfect because life always comes with new challenges, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. You know, you, yeah. You jump over one hurdle, and then a car hits you from the side. So <laughs> exactly, this is it, and this is what it is being a human being. But it's just really gorgeous when we make those moves. A song that's coming to my mind right now. There was a song in the '90s. I don't know if you remember it uh, by a guy. But it's it was Stilt Skin called Inside, and right. he said. Don't keep it all inside. That was like the chorus, like right. this amazing Scottish rock band. I, I think that was the only song they ever released, actually, that got successful. But um, don't keep it all inside. You know, when we share that stuff, when we when we release how we feel, when we that's the place that we get to process stuff from. You know, it's so important for us to keep externalizing stuff. You know, the breakthroughs that we have as we share, because when we keep it all inside, we're not meant to do that as human beings. We need to be releasing. We yeah. need to be. We need to be communicating and releasing and it's going to feel scary if we're not used to it. Feel the fear, do it anyway. Yeah. All the way. See, I, I'm much more comfortable kind of just writing very personal songs now and just pouring it out because I, to be honest, I, I rush to do so. You know, I just think... You've I'm... broken through that block. We, yeah. We, we break through that block, don't we? Like... I think people, anyone that does listen to my, my original band probably just expects it now and they'll yeah. probably be quite disappointed if we don't do that you know we um chris who's one of the uh, guitarists in the band um is pretty much the same as me and we we write 
very similar in uh, in the in the terms of that in that like the way that we approach the songs uh, and his songs that he's I don't think he's ever written a song that's not personal. Um, and we we've both gone through some similar things in the last couple of years as well. So we've ended up writing. Um, like we we both lost as fathers in the la- in oh, in last couple sorry. of years. Um, but we wrote two songs. Uh, like I wrote a song which was for my dad. Um, when I found out that he'd not got very long, and I wanted to show it to him, but he mm. um he kept kind of putting it off for a while, saying, "Oh well, let's just." Let's not be morbid now. Let's enjoy ourselves. I mean, you know, the guy was still going to watch his favourite type of bands days before he actually checked out, shall we say. Um, so he never actually heard it. So I'm gutted about that because yeah. I wrote it for him. But it's it's going to get released later this year with, the, you know, with the album and everything like that. And I thought, oh, well, I've only wrote it for you and you're you're the only one that's not going to hear it now. So it's really frustrating in a way. It's frustrating. But the, the, the way that it will resonate with so many others, you know, if mm. you share it with that story, it could yeah. be just so powerful. What will con- c- communicate to, to, you know, young men who've lost their fathers, there'll be there'll be something in that, um, you know, as well, that, w- that it will go even further than it would have done just, you yeah. know, with your dad hearing it. I do think as well, I like there's a, there's a lot of people that go, because I, I was brought up in that kind of time where it's like, Boys don't cry, and you don't tell people how you curse. feel. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, a curse, isn't it? Yeah, that? yeah. You know, don't don't show like affection to to your dad and things like that. Uh-huh. It's not it's not manly and all that type uh-huh. of stuff. And then as we kind of as me and my dad got old, you know, we got older. I, we we started kind of like opening up a little bit more. But he never really wanted to talk about anything too like dark or whatever at the time. Because I because I, I wrote I, I wrote the song um, and I. Obviously, I mean, it's not. We're not even done the track list yet, and I'm I'm telling people song names, but it's uh, it's called all the things I never said, and I wanted to tell him Ooh, all this stuff. How poignant! Well, I I were really he never heard it. Yeah, and it's yeah. So I'm hoping that when it does come out, that it might kind of encourage people to just kind of talk to people that mean something to them Gorgeous. and explain. You know, Gorgeous. well, you know, I I've wanted to say this to you for a long time, so I'm going to say it while and share you're here. it with that story. That's so, that's so beautiful. Um, do you think your dad was afraid of the emotion being overwhelmed by the emotion of if he did hear it? Because it sounds like he did very much have a block to hearing it. It wasn't. He was like, oh yeah, let's play it me straight away. He yeah. was putting it off, wasn't it? Do you think he was afraid? Yeah, yeah he's. He, I mean, he was brought up obviously in a in a time where you definitely couldn't. Oh you yeah, know, that generation. Show any kind of yeah. It very was very challenging. You know, he's, he he's kind of worked like I think he worked on the mines and pits when he first left school and stuff like that. So the you, shut that, up and put up. Yeah, just get on with it. And he, he actually said to me that in his like last few years, he said, just started kind of like feeling all emotional. Never felt that way before. He says like, films will make me cry when I've never cried at a film before, you know. Like, I'm ridiculous, me. Like, oh, you know, me too. I, I can, I, I, you, you can put me in front of Love Your Garden for 20 minutes and I'm... <laughs> Buckets. The flowers are just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. forgot what they finally wanted. Yeah, I cry more at stuff that moves me <laughs> happily sometimes. You know, oh, yeah. it's just so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, you know, being that state of releasing. Oh, I'm lot. ridiculous. I, I literally like the tiniest thing I see, something I hear, it just sets me off now. And I, and I didn't, beautiful. I wasn't like that in my twenties. Yeah. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm closing in on 38 now and I'm like already I'm like oh my god I'm just like an absolute emotional wreck all the time yeah. <laughs> with everything sometimes for good things like you say do you, you know? see that as a as a as a positive thing now I think so yeah yeah because before I felt like I just kind of blocked it out or pretended it wasn't there and then anything I would worry about I'd be like well, I'll just go and drink 10 it bottles of beer. Mm. It, it makes us ill. Suppression is, is a chronic state that this nation has got into the habit of. Suppressing feelings, hiding who we are, modifying our behaviour, abandoning the authentic parts of who we are, not showing up as us. And shutting up and putting up. It's that age-old Yorkshire saying, shut up and put up. Yeah, yeah. It is what it is kind of thing. That, Suck up, you know, don't share it is a curse. It is damaging. It causes illness. It, it lowers the immune system. It's it we we can't show up in life like that anymore. 
yeah. the, more, the more of us that start speaking out loud about how we feel like you sharing your story in your book that you wrote, you know, like I've made it a habit to share my story everywhere I go. Even if I get a vulnerability hangover from it sometimes, I, I, I do it just, just, just because it, it normalizes that we all struggle. Yeah. There's no one in our lives that doesn't struggle. Get that around yeah. your head around it. Because <laughs> I tell you what, when you've seen in sound thousands of people's heads, because I've run these groups for so many years, mental health groups, and when you've seen inside thousands of people's heads, you suddenly realize like everybody's struggling with their emotions on some level, even the people that are very, very happy. And mm -hmm. it might be authentic that they're very, very happy, but they still go through difficult times. We still go through loss. That's We go through circumstances that we feel are beyond our control. You know, we all have a, a variable palette of emotions. None of us are just stable. So the more of us that can share that and the more of us that know that, the more open so many more people will be and and you know that's how we really really support the healing of the world you know this stopping suppressing I mean if you look at if you think about like a pipe uh, that's leading to a tap if we don't turn that tap on and there's water pulsing through it that pipe is going to burst yeah okay we are what is it like 60% water. I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to get scientific <laughs> yeah. again. I'm just saying this is what happens. I'm trying to get, I don't know. But I'll, I'll overdub it. Yeah. I'll try and mimic your <laughs> Dub voice. Dub over any of the science <laughs> bits with like a robot's voice or something. Or maybe like yeah, a search engine just uh, speaking it up. But you know, if we don't share that, we are that pipe. We <laughs> we yeah. are that pipe. Uh, it's not the most profound thing I've ever said, you know, but we, we are, we can see ourselves like that and we break. Yeah. We break down if we do not share and process and make sure we share. And she'll tell you what, if there's anyone listening who's like, well, I don't have anyone to share with. I don't feel safe being vulnerable with anyone. I don't feel like there's anyone that would understand. Helplines are not just for people who are actively suicidal. Yeah, I want to make that very clear. You know, Samaritans 116123, anyone can call any time of the day and night. If you just need to take a bit of time to verbally process something that you're going through, it's okay. That's you protecting your mental health. There is always somewhere to turn. There is always somewhere to turn. And it's very important that people start sharing how they feel. Mm. And the more we do that, then we might feel safer next time to share with a friend when we're met with that love and kindness. Um, and, you know, no one... No one should be suffering in silence in this world. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm very much like it's probably every four or five years as a pattern, the pipes yeah. burst. Oh because, yeah. And uh, even though I'm fully aware as I've got older that you know, just let a little bit out every now and then. Um, and obviously, like we're talking about like recent losses and grief and things yes. like that. Um, I because I I'd not really got used to well I, I never really experienced it to that level I've lost people before but I never experienced it to that level yeah, to a your point father is... where yeah. I felt like uh, I could control how it was coming out so I actually after a while just avoided like alcohol because the moment I got past four drinks I was a mess and I was, and and then I, that, then I was like very aware that like oh my god I'm a burden on everybody else and I'm ruining everyone's night or wherever we are and no one wants to be around me now because I'm they know that oh my god if Matt has the X amount yeah. of drinks he's just going to go on an absolute downer so it took me time just to get like back on the horse shall we say yeah. uh, from that and it's like now I can quite you know I can talk the two years ago I couldn't talk like this to you because I'd, yeah. I'd be in floods of tears you know yeah. <laughs> so it's um but I'm at a point where, like, yeah, it does hurt. Yeah, it's not nice. Yeah, the, you know. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, well, there's people out there that they've never known the parents. There's people out there that lost them much younger than me. I'm lucky that yeah. I had that person in my life for that amount of time. So that's how I have to try and look at it now. And that's yeah. how it's, that's my way of helping me kind of accept it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that works for everybody, but yeah. there's, there's, there's so many different things that people can do to it's, get through it absolutely and it's really beautiful that the power that we all have to reframe a situation we do all have that power to shift our mindset and you know I like to look at it it's like we can be looking at a situation through a lens of fear or through a lens of love you know what what lens are we looking through like what glasses have we got on that we're seeing a situation through now this this doesn't mean that we don't 
honor our feelings because that can be toxic, can't it? Toxic positivity. We've all heard of that. Like, mm. oh no, it's fine. It's fine. You know, we're just saying the opposite of how we feel. It's damaging. It doesn't work. So there has to be some kind of deep honoring of that grief, of that pain, of that fear, of whatever it is, a deep honoring and an acknowledgement of that and a hearing that voice and honoring it within. And then we go to the mindset shift. You know, so so we, we have to allow ourselves to feel the stuff as well. And then we do move through into that beautiful mindset shift that, you know, you spoke of like, how can I, how can I see this differently? And all it takes is our willingness. All it takes is, A Course in Miracles calls it the little willingness. All it takes is your willingness. It doesn't ma- mean that it might happen just like this, like overnight with the click of our fingers, but it just means that we're like, I, we can even say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to see this differently. I'm willing to see this differently. So we honor that pain and we balance it with going, okay, show me how I can see this differently. Yeah. You know, and we surrender up in that way through the pain, through the loss, through the grief. We suppress nothing. We don't dishonor ourselves and we don't try and sweep stuff under the carpet, but we do recognize our power to to choose those beautiful reframings that just lift our spirits a little bit more. Yeah. And we move forward with that grace. Yeah. I've, um, as time's gone on, like not saying it's every, every time I ex- encounter someone that's maybe difficult in life. Uh, as I've got older, I've started kind of thinking, well, maybe that person's going through something. So that's why they've just done that bad thing, you I know, and, that. and it's, I love that. And again, it's you know it's something else I've put pen to paper with uh, in the last couple of years because I've worked in care with vulnerable kids, yeah. and then uh, a couple of years ago I, I'd seen um, I don't know if you'd ever heard of a, a prisoner called uh, Robert Maudsley. No. Um, so I ended up writing about him because I was fascinated, but I also feel sorry for him, even though he's done some terrible things. So he's. Yeah. Uh, he'd kind of uh, grown up in in care. He'd suffered abuse by people that were supposed to look after him and things like that. Grew up, ran away, um, then basically had to sell himself to uh, to males just to feed himself. Um, and then his first crime came along because one of his clients uh, turned up with some kind of underage images saying that this was like a role play thing he wanted to do. So he killed him, uh, went to prison. And then while he was in prison, um, come across another paedophile, barricaded himself into a room with him and basically killed him with a blunt spoon. Uh, apparently, I mean, I don't remember this. I don't know if it was before I was born or not, or maybe I was a child, but it's the headline was they called him the brain eater. He didn't actually yeah. consume this person, but he'd, he'd done that to him and part of me like i thought reading all the things that he's gone through i thought this he wouldn't all he wouldn't have to go down that path if those things had not happened to him yeah i mean we're all a product of our condition yeah uh so i ended up writing a song completely all about him and his story his life just called who created me and when we've wow. we've, we've played it live Ooh, got chills. when yeah. i when i when i introduce we've played it a few times live just to road test it before we get out properly with it uh and i when i introduce it i think people think i'm talking about god and it you know and it's my situation talking about god but when when you actually dissect it and listen to it you'll you'll especially if when you hear it in the future now and you'll you'll hear it you'll be like Oh my god, and it's it's very sinister in places, but very sad at the same time. Yeah. And you just think, wow, like there's people walking the streets and we who just know. actively just you know they they may have I don't know they may have harmed somebody and not been gone through all the things that he's gone through. You know, yeah. it's uh, I feel like we've gone very dark, but it's like no, no, <laughs> this is very light. This is very light. What you're talking about this, yeah. this sort of bringing through of compassion and. It's not always easy for us when we've been through abuse ourselves to to be able to go look through that compassionate lens. It can be <laughs> really challenging. It yeah. can be excruciating, actually. And and you don't have to. Yeah, I, I want to make that clear. You don't yeah. have to if you've been through something really, really difficult. However, one of my favorite quotes is 
the people who need the most love will ask for it in the most unloving of ways. And yeah. sometimes that we, when we see someone acting a certain way, whether it's even someone with road rage, ah, you know, whatever it is, to take that breath and go, okay, we don't know what that person's going through is very, very powerful. And also the same, like I've researched a lot recently because I did a talk on intergenerational trauma. So I've researched a lot of my family history and I went through a lot of abuse as a child and really, really difficult circumstances. When I started picking apart my family history, and seeing the conditioning that my mum had been through, you know, I, I, I love my mum to bits. You know, she was just very traumatized, mm. very, very traumatized. It was very, it was incredibly healing for me to be able to go. Of course, it makes sense why she was like she was. Yeah. And the stories I created about me as a result of my trauma were not true. It was never about me. It was never personal against me. It was that she was so traumatized. And it doesn't mean that we excuse, condone, or justify anyone's behavior. No, none of that is part of this healing process. It does not mean that. It means that we choose to shift the lens that we're viewing through into that lens of compassion and understanding instead. It doesn't mean that we reinstate a relationship that causes harm either. Mm. It doesn't mean that we that we actively start liking someone. <laughs> it, it doesn't mean any of that. Yeah. We're looking at how we can heal. And I think that when we can do stuff like you're talking about with, with people that are unrelated to us, who aren't part of our traumatic story or, what, or something that's directly happened with us, we can use that as a practicing ground, this sort of tilting our head and going, of what happened to that person. There, there was actually a, um, a program on Netflix recently called I Am A Killer. Right. And I, I've watched a couple of those episodes and it, 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 it's very much like what you're talking about here where, where there's people who've perpetrated some horrific crimes and they're just sharing to the camera what they went through. And again, we don't go, oh, well, it's fine what you did then. Nothing to do with that. Yeah, you know, there's some horrific things, but we go, we go, I can see why you ended up where you were. You were in so much pain, you know, and, and when we when we start to release that judgment, it can be very powerful for us. You don't have to do it. <laughs> no one has to do that. It's yeah. not like essential, is it? But it is very powerful what you're talking about there. Yeah, I've uh, I've watched quite a few. Uh, we we watch like things like that where they'll take you into prisons and um so I'm not like the biggest Piers Morgan fan, but I've seen him interviewing certain people. Mm -hmm. He does ask the does ask the questions you want to know the answers to sometimes, doesn't he? Does, he? he does it for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, and, I, and sometimes I'll I'll kind of listen to what they're saying. Um, some of these men and women in various you know parts of the world, and and I'm like, wow, like it's almost no wonder that you became the way you were based Absolutely. on the upbringing that you've had or the things you've gone through, and it's. I find that with a lot of like the people I've worked with in the past in in care, and I think if you've met when you get to the if you get an opportunity to meet some parents for certain people, I'm not saying it's the case for everyone, but some people I've thought, no wonder this child is the way they are Absolutely. because I'm like wow. But then I don't know what that parents gone through and what their parent were like and what's and happened to it them. It will so be something really disruptive. It, it yeah, feels we'll like a bit back. of a conveyor belt of people because it it's then... intergenerational trauma for sure it's it's the it, intergenerational trauma all it means is trauma that's been passed down and trauma is not about the things that have happened to us trauma is the the beliefs we create as a response to what happened to us like you said before about this carrying this big bag around with you that's the trauma the trauma is the baggage we carry forward the trauma is what's happening in us in the present moment that we've because the thing that in the past has already happened that's yeah. in the past we can't change it but when we start to frame trauma in a way where we're looking at it where we're going okay, what are the beliefs that I still carry because of what happened to me? You know, yeah. I'm not safe. I'm not lovable. I need to change myself to be accepted. All this stuff. When we start framing that is the trauma, that is trauma. I'm scared of being around people or whatever it is. Then we start to know we can do something about that. And, and intergenerational trauma, all it is, is trauma that's been passed down. Yeah. So, so one person's response to their trauma and their conditioning, they don't feel lovable, whatever that is. They pass that on and treat, the child that way that child. but we all have the power to break the cycle uh, we all have the power to recognize our conditioning coming up in the moment and not be that way towards our children mm. you know it's not always easy 
it doesn't it's not always a clean break as well is it like when i talk about the <laughs> it's, not. it's not just a case of oh i can just throw the bag off and feel fine sometimes your leg gets caught in the strap and you're dragging it along for a little <laughs> bit longer you know <laughs> beautiful visual going on there <laughs> should we make a cartoon on yeah. that it's true it's not as simple as just throwing off the bag but it's like lightening the load that bit by bit we release that stuff along the way and you know we start to learn a new identity becoming who you are is not about bringing in new things. It's about letting go of everything that you are not, shedding those layers as we go along. And I say becoming who you are because we've all learned certain things about ourselves that are not true. Even if we had an amazing childhood with our parents, what about the school system that we spoke about before? What about yeah. the what we've seen in the media? What about, you know, if we've been a, a race that's underrepresented in our class or all these different things are, are traumatic, you know, in inverted commas that, that, you know, in which ways have we been taught that we do not belong? It's traumatic. And when we start to frame it like that, we can start to recognize that it's the present moment in which we can do something. We can't change what happened, but in the present moment, we can learn the truth of who we are. I mean, and the truth of who we are is that we're all limitless and that we're all worthy exactly as we are and we're all acceptable and we all belong. And, you know, that is the truth, that there is no ceiling to how much you can grow and how much you can achieve in this life. There is not a ceiling to that. And, you know, people might not be in belief of that. Well, I'd really, really challenge you to make the highest priority in your life, focusing on your identity and those stories you tell yourself about yourself and start forgiving them one by one, the, the misperceptions you've created about yourself because of difficult things in your life. And when you make that your highest priority, things will start to dramatically change in your life when you start recognizing the truth of who you are. It's one of the core topics that we look at in Heroes. And it's actually very groundbreaking for people to recognize that, you know, anytime they're in fear or pain or, you know, fear of loss or whatever that is, they're not embodying the truth of who they are because in truth, we're all healed already. <laughs> in truth, we, we have, we were born as, as, you know, we can call it the higher self, you know, we were born clean of all that stuff. Yes, genes passed down. I won't get, again, I'm not going to get scientific genes yeah. <laughs> because sometimes pass down, whatever, whatever. We're, but, but we're born in a higher self and then stuff starts happening. All the stuff that starts happening and all the beliefs that we create from that might surround that higher self, but the higher self never goes anywhere. <laughs> the <laughs> higher self is always there in the moments that you feel in distress. Just know there is peace in you still. Even if it feels like 0.001% peace, the process of healing is about coming back to that piece again and again and again and tapping in and tuning into that part and growing that voice instead of the voice of fear. And bit by bit, it will grow. If, you, if that's where you put your focus, it will grow. That part of you that's at peace already in every single moment never goes anywhere and we can liken it almost to like a sun surrounded by clouds that's within all of us the truth of who we are you know at peace already limitless powerful worthy in full knowledge of the power and worth of yourself and then it gets surrounded by these clouds of things that happen and the beliefs we create about ourselves but we can move further and further towards the parting of those clouds and recognize that the sun never goes anywhere so it's with you in those darkest moments yeah, your clouds are the big distractions and obstacles in life they that really just keeps are. appearing. <laughs> you, they you, really are. Yeah, it's yeah. come to rain on your picnic today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking uh, about Morrissey again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. I'm not not really a, a Morrissey fan, really, to be honest with you. I can appreciate his work, but he's not someone I would sit and listen to. Neither, neither would I. Neither would I, to be honest. I feel like I should probably sit and listen to his stuff a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's. Um, I feel like I, I I do that. It's like I'm very aware that where where my kind of like happy place can be and how I want to be, and uh, I just feel like I I sometimes don't always it doesn't always align. I'll I'll yeah. I'll veer off somewhere because I get distracted by something that's going on in life, and part of me is thinking, oh, I'll just go with it, and then it gets so far to a point where I'm yeah. like, oh, this is quite harmful to me now. I need to make myself. I need to do whatever I need to do to get back to where I need to be again because it's um, 
it, it's you know I, I start kind of getting to a point where I struggle then but it's I, I get to I'm always doing that thing where it's where it's almost nearly at the point of no return and then I'm like oh my god it's gonna be so much hard work now to get, make myself happy and feel stable again yeah, uh, and I know a lot of people do the same they'll just keep pushing themselves whether they're overworking themselves or yeah. they're putting so much into I don't know it might be a relationship or yes. whatever it might be um, and they just just keep throwing everything they've got into it knowing full well that it's just not it's like throwing yourself into a well again and again and again it's <laughs> like about uh, you know coming back to the, the to presence the the awareness that we bring to it the awareness that we bring to what we're doing, the awareness that we bring to the patterns that we're partaking in. Are we overworking again? Are we distracting ourselves? The more that we can come to presence and going, oh, okay, I'm doing that again. Interesting. Then even if we carry on doing it, we again, we're training the brain to be a witness, be a watcher of what's happening. And that's how we grow our consciousness. And the more conscious we are, of the ways in which we interact, again, we will just change that organically because when we become aware of it, we're like, oh my God, I don't want to live like this anymore. And I don't want to live a life like this in a circle, in a pattern, repeating again and again and again. So this awareness that we bring is so powerful. And then then quite naturally, we start to choose new pathways and it requires discipline. But discipline, really what it means is the growing of new habit, habits and the forming of new patterns. And discipline is always going to be about doing the stuff that we don't want to do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and celebrating ourselves for it. You know, discipline, it doesn't take discipline to do something we really want to do. It doesn't take discipline to go have, have a drink after a hard day, does it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I need to sit down and have a drink right now. I've really got to sit down and have a, have a Prosecco or whatever, you know. Oh, God, we, um, just slightly off subject, but I I just cannot drink as much as I could yeah, at all. Yeah, I. I. think because I, I. Cause I, do, I don't drink when, I'm, when, I've got, when I know I've got to sing because I try to be as on form as, as possible. Because you've become aware. Yeah. This does not support me in feeling good in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we did, uh, it's been Valentine's Day quite recently and we, we don't normally go out. We went out last year because it was just like a bit of a rare opportunity, but we usually, uh, we just stay in and we think it's the cheesiest, like, Valentine's Day ever. We just go, we're going to have do uh, Domino's are nasty because... Oh, <laughs> we, nice. We just, we're not into, like, f well, we, we you know, everybody likes a bit of fancy food every now and then, but just for the sake of it, we're like... Well, this is like this is home and this is comfort stuff, and that's what we do. And I'd had half a bottle of Asti, and I was like, "Wow, my face is fuzzy." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I used to be able to drink. God that's knows how it. much. It could and never fill me. Before. It's very interesting, isn't it? When we start looking at old things that we've done and how we didn't even notice how they affected us and then we partake in that conversation with someone that was bad for us or we pick up the food that wasn't good for us or the drink whatever it is and we really when we when we've changed ourselves so much we go oh my god that was so toxic and we know we're more sensitive we <laughs> notice it don't we yeah that how bad that must have been for us you know um how could i have been doing that in the past you know i'm like that with relationships quite a lot of the time like I would find it intolerable to spend, you know, an hour with one of my exes that I used to be feel madly in love with. Probably not not bad people. I'm not yeah, talking yeah. about someone that's been bad or even abusive just or a anything. Bad match. <laughs> but just like, oh my god, we were so incompatible, and now you know, I've grown and changed. I would find it intolerable to even sit for an hour with him and have a conversation. Yeah, I feel like you're a lot of people, including myself, they settle for a lot less when they're younger. Hell yeah. And as you get older, you just think, I'm not dealing with this crap We're anymore. always <laughs> choosing a reflection. It, yeah, exactly. We're not dealing with, the, with this crap anymore. Uh, we, we're always choosing a reflection of how we value ourselves. Every choice that we make in this life, we're choosing from that place of who we believe we are. We're always choosing in alignment with what we feel we're worthy of. And that includes the partners that we pick. It mm. includes, you know, what we're getting back to as a, as a reflection from a person or a job or a situation. Um, and really, we're, as we change and as we grow, it's an inside job. This is why it's so insane to try and change the other person. I'm talking particularly about in relationships. It's so insane to just be trying to change the other person. You need to do more of this for me. You need to, you're not showing up. To... It's like, okay, when I change myself, I will walk away if that's not good for me. 
Yeah. Like, change yourself. I think it's as as well uh, it falls into that subject of where we were talking about just being being yourself and not caring what others think. When I now that I do that more, it kind of filters out the people that aren't good for me because Hell yeah. if they don't like how I am now, they're not going to stick around and it kind of does you a favor because you don't have to avoid them because they've gone already and I'm like, oh, brilliant. Yeah. Life's much calmer and so there's no drama beautiful. and it's just and it can be quite organic <laughs> yeah it can be quite organic because we either grow together or we grow apart we, we you know we, we, we're all vibrating at different frequencies i don't know what you want to call it but you know different energies and we either grow together or we grow apart and you know by you know clearing a space of, of someone that's not vibrating at the same frequency as us or you know offering what we what we want to be in alignment with how we value ourselves when we clear that way we need fear we fear not we fear not because the space that opens up when we clear that way is like a magnet bringing forward to you new opportunities new people that are really in alignment with you and you, we can trust that we can trust that we never need to fear ending a relationship oh my god but what if I'm on my own again it's these brave steps that we take where we feel the fear and do it anyway and we trust you know we absolutely trust and have that faith that something new will come along and it always does when we when we're working in that flow um and claiming our worth claiming our worth choosing who we want to be around we can't take everyone with us mm. so sometimes you know people in the groups they'll come to like week seven or eight of the program and they'll be like i don't want to see any of my old friends anymore i've you know i don't feel like being around them anymore and and it's like you've changed you've, yeah you've changed beautiful beautiful you don't have to keep going back there you don't get halfway up the mountain and r r go back down keep going keep growing keep glowing right <laughs> am i rapping <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know and as we move up that mountain we appreciate the view along the way and new people will meet us up along the way uh, as, as high as we are there'll be other people up there that that will vibrate with us so never ever fear ending a relationship for fear of being on your own yeah i've uh there's a lot of people that i i i especially in my 20s and i was doing a lot more kind of traveling around there was what i would almost class as acquaintances to a certain level yeah which i thought were kind of friends but but not uh hundreds of people and i'm thinking well because at school i was kind of one of the background kids so i thought well now i'm an adult and I want to do music and I want yeah. to I want to be the popular person now it's my turn blah 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 and then I'd be around all these people for the sake of the numbers yes and it but there was no kind of connections Draining. on on a level that was beneficial to either of us really and as time's gone on that's all dwindled away and it's just been a natural progression because I think I've I've just got this small circle that Beautiful. I've chosen to have, and I, and I love it because it's it's friends that I I trust them all, you know. There's there's no hassle with them, and I've got some ones that I see regularly, some that we're just busy and we check in every now and then. But it's as if we see each other every week because we just pick up where we left off, and and they're they're really important to me. I'm not saying that I don't care about the other people that I've met along the way because there's some people very nice, like you said, and they've not done anything <laughs> wrong. There's just Yeah, they don't just have to nothing, be bad people. There's just nothing there. Yeah. It's just, you're just around people. So there's a lot of people I just see and they're just nice to chat to if you saw yeah. them somewhere, if, whether it's at a show or whatever, but nothing against them, but it's just not, I, I've just gotten, there's nothing inside me that wants to go, let's let's hang out, let's go yeah. for a drink, let's do this. I'm just... We have to listen That's to nice that person. because we also become like the five people we spend our most time with. Well, not even just five, uh, you know, that's just a, a classic quote, you know, mm. but we become like the people that we spend a lot of time with. We, we, we organically as human beings, we, we pick up on stuff, we pick up on energy, we pick up on habits. And, and, you know, so as we change, a lot of the time our circle does get smaller Mm. You know, we, we, we might have people on the periphery, but our circle can get a lot smaller of who we would actually go to with a problem. Because for me, it's like 
if I used to have a problem, there'd be certain friends that I'd go to and they'd be like, oh my God, that is awful. Such and such. I don't want that anymore. I want I want someone who'll, who'll remind me of what I've learned and go, okay, could you be seeing this differently? I want to be challenged. Yeah. I, don't, I would never take any of my pain to any of my friends that I know now would just go, oh my God, that is just awful. What a bastard or you know yeah. I don't I don't want that anymore I, I don't want it anymore you know um and obviously we want people around us that honor honor our pain you know and go god wow that sounds hard but but I don't want to get into like a bitch fest so yeah. so so and I know spaces that I used to go to because it would make me feel good letting it now I'd be very very careful and like you say that circle's got a lot smaller of who I would take those difficulties to because what they do with that is going to either feed our pain or heal it. Yeah. And my highest priority in life is healing. I don't know about you, but it's like my yeah. highest priority, I want to feel good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we have to be very, very careful about who we allow in our inner circle. And, you know, we can feel great loss. When I talk about ending relationships, I'm not even just talking about intimate partnerships or romantic relationships. Sometimes friendships end too. Yeah. It's happened a lot for me over the last couple I've of years. I've done that with friends and yeah. fam and family, certain yes. family members. I'm just, yes. just, we're, we're, this is not going to work. This yes. You're not good for me. I'm not good for you. Yes. I'm sure that's a song, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it could be. We've written quite a lot of songs on this podcast. It's totally true though, isn't it? Because we, we could still completely love that person. We want the best for that person. We respect that person. We honour who that person is. But there's something not, there anymore that we would not want to spend that much time and it's a beautiful thing and I think it's something really to be celebrated I think it's absolutely beautiful as we grow that we move on to new things in that expansion mindset and some people will come with us yeah some people will really be on that journey with us which is gorgeous but we have to clear that way we have to clear that way and be brave enough to clear that way and not just cling on to the past yeah there's there's a lot of people in the world you don't have to force Eight these billion things. Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't have to force it on the ten yeah. people that are, live within five mile radius of your exactly. house, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I used to get upset if someone bought a car that I wanted to buy it, you know, and then like, oh, I'll have to go and find another one now. And like it's yeah. it's easy to do. Don't get stressed yeah. about it. <laughs> There's a, just go on, go on an app. There's another one there. <laughs> There's abundance of everything in this life. You know, a lot yeah. of us have been wired uh, in this society with like a massive lack mentality. I know I certainly was, you know, that there's lack of people out there or there's lack of, you know, opportunities or that, oh, there's only one opportunity and there's so many people going for it. It's like a real lack mentality. So many human, it's a real suffering of the human condition. Yeah. Oh my God, it's a disease of the human condition is lack mentality. And again, we, we don't want to look to, to shift the external. We want to shift that mentality within us and start to frame things in a different way, you know. And that requires that we start celebrating other people's achievements on some level as well and going, oh, my God, that person's had that opportunity. I celebrate that in them. Because, because you know, law of attraction or whatever you want to call it, energy does not discriminate. <laughs> we, we can't feel bad about someone having an opportunity. The energy we're give, giving off with that is I don't want this opportunity that's the energy it's this grievance energy which was never mm. going to get us what we want in this life so the more that we can also celebrate you know others achieving things we want surrounding ourselves with people who are who are achieving amazing things and and being inspired by that and cheerleading that in them then we're on that frequency and that stuff is magnetized towards us not like magic law of attraction is not magic but it's that we see ourselves in a different way and the yeah. choices that we take are very different from that place because if we only see that opportunity and we've narrowed down and that person's got that opportunity and i haven't we shut off everything we will not see this beacon of another opportunity over here right next to us we won't see it from that energy so law of attraction is not magic it's about having ourselves in the mindset of wow there's an abundance of opportunities here and and they're not running out and and rejection is redirection and protection and obstacles are detours in the right direction and you know so, so working on our lack mentality is very powerful for you know achieving things we want in this life for sure yeah, I uh, especially as when I was a lot younger, if if I saw someone else getting an opportunity, with it, more so in music, if oh, I wanted yeah. that, I wouldn't be 
celebrating it and happy for them. I'd be down about myself. Why have I not done that? Why am I not achieving that? Yes. And I'd be questioning myself rather than being happy for them. Not in, I don't know whether I'd call it a jealousy thing or not, yeah. but maybe it were, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's a form of jealousy. I, I don't yes. really know. But as I've got older, I'm like when I see things now, so you say that like a, a band that's on the same circuit as Farrah and my band, and, we, and then we've all been playing on the same level for a long time, and then suddenly someone jumps up. I'm like, wow, fair play, you know. They're cause, showing cause, me it's possible. Yeah. And How it's, amazing. That's showing me it's possible. We have that choice, don't we, to celebrate it? But yeah, I had to work on that a lot in myself as well because it doesn't come naturally. And it, and it <laughs> yeah, and it, and it contributed towards when we're talking about that pipe being like shut off at the end. I'm, it would just be something else piling into that pipe and I'm thinking, oh my God, like everything's crap. I'm, yeah. I'm wasting my time. Every, I can't, I'm, I'm obviously not capable of the things that I'm dreaming of achieving, you know, and it's, uh, but, but as, as time's gone on, it's just like, I'm just enjoying the journey now, yeah. you know, rather than worrying about what's going to happen. Because I just think, well, I'm only going to get uh, put in a box and burnt anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it won't matter then, will it? So. This is it. Enjoying the journey. And that, that's the really beautiful thing about focusing not on how well we do, particularly if we've got like big things coming up or things that we're worried about you know goals that we want to reach the the importance is having fun and yeah. that might sound a bit simple and a bit wacky but the more we can have fun along the way well your energy is going to be ripe for success we just need to watch our energy again we want to focus less on controlling the external stuff i need it to happen in this way and go I choose and keep coming back to training our minds. I choose to have fun along the way. Yeah. I choose to have fun when I go out onto stage tonight. I, ch I choose to do that, you know, because it can be quite, I I've, I've had horrifying performance anxiety, both with music and like with public speaking. It's my whole, because my whole belief system that I created as a child was I'm not likable. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy of attention i'm not important my, my beliefs that i created in childhood were the back breaking really really excruciating and so i watch that all rise like when i when i'm going to do something really big like give a big talk or you know even when i when i did my album launch the fear was huge and huge and huge but again it's about coming back to witnessing that stuff rise becoming very aware of it and comforting those parts and going come here it's okay you, you know reassuring those parts bringing that comfort through and fusing that with all I need to do here is enjoy I'm gonna have fun I'm gonna allow myself give myself permission to enjoy this experience and then fusing the third little thing in the recipe of I'm what can I give what yeah. can I give? This is not about me. What what can I give? How can I be of service? What can I offer in this performance? What can I offer? Even if we work on the checkout, beautiful, beautiful opportunities. How can I be of service? How can I smile more at this person today? As a mother, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a performer to put this stuff into practice. And the more we do that from where we are at, the more you will grow that is the law of attraction the, the more that you just organically will grow having fun along the way comforting the fear witnessing it and being of service it's just a recipe for growth it's a and it's a recipe for it's a recipe for achievement yeah we, we don't focus on the achievement anywhere in that <laughs> <laughs> we're not focusing on an outcome anywhere in that or having a tunnel vision on it needs to be this exact way and it needs this exact outcome it's it's way more expansive than that. It's way more relaxed than that. Yeah. It's a fine art. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's, always easy. No, it's <laughs> it's it's like when you're talking about um, the way you're feeling like before you're going on, whether it be on stage or oh, you're doing terror. doing a uh, <laughs> you, or you you may be doing a, a motivational speech. Yeah. I think it's something that you you eventually will like fall into the comfort of, isn't it? Because it's like I got no qualms walking out at a festival when we get them uh, to thousands of people and playing playing whatever we're going to play 
and I'm not worried about it because I'm in complete control of the situation. It's it's I just go out and I think this is my gig and I'm gonna do it how I want. But then if you said to me, Come and talk about I don't know whether it be something music, mental health related, whatever, in front of twenty people in a room, I would be terrified. And I think it's because they've got the opportunity to question me yeah. and there's gonna be some bounce back and because I'm not I don't know what's coming and I'm not gonna be prepared for it. I'm worried that I'm just going to completely crumble. Where is it a show? No one's going to ask me a question mid <laughs> mid gig because I can't hear them. You get them. the odd heckler. Sometimes. Oh yeah, it's not a festival. Well, I've I've done enough to uh, to handle them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard them all, but but I think it's just because maybe if I'd done say hundred motivational speak speeches, I might feel. All yes. right, doing it eventually, yeah. but at first I'd be. I think absolutely. I'd, I don't at think first, I could do it. We, you know, it would it would be insane to not be scared. Really, at first, mm. but if we want to do so, I mean, it's not like the, you know the feel the fear the do it do it anyway stuff. It's not about like doing stuff that we don't really want to do. Yeah. If I'm scared of that, I've got to do it anyway. But the stuff that we really, really, really want to do that's going to lead to the biggest growth in our lives, and it's going to lead to the biggest way of teaching those inner child parts or wounded parts of us, those fear-based thought systems and belief systems that we've created, the biggest way to heal that is to to just really practice great discipline with pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. It's so important. It's so important. Or those parts of us that are in fear will stay that way forever. Yeah. Fear will never go. We have to teach them something new. We have to teach them it's safe because... If you sit and wait for the fear to go before you do something, well, guess what? I swear to God, you'll be waiting forever. Yeah. I can guarantee you, you'll be waiting forever if you put it at arm's length and go, when this happens, I'll. No. Yeah. Say yes. If you get an <laughs> opportunity, say yes. No, oh, maybe I'll, you know, you just go for it. You know, you've got the power. Everybody's got the power. To, yeah. to be able to do things that they're, that they're very afraid of that they really, really want to do. See, I, I got, uh, I think it might have been around late 2019, I'd got invited to a little book group to go and talk about the book that I'd oh, put out. Oh, beautiful. And I didn't go because I was terrified yeah. of talking to them about it. I thought, because it, it took enough to just to get it down on paper in a room on my own. Yeah. Uh, I say on paper, I typed it up, but it was... Uh, yeah. But then to go and actually talk about it, because I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have to have conversations about these situations and things like that. And I, and I didn't go. Part of me regrets it now because yeah. I was like, oh, maybe I maybe I should have done that. But at the same time, I just think I would have been absolutely petrified. There was yeah. probably going to be about 10 people there. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> that can be even more scary, though, can't it? I when there's it... a smaller group, more intimate yeah. group. Yeah. Because friends say to me, they'll be like, do you not get nervous when you if you get to play a really big show sometimes I don't know because it's just they're just kind of mush into this and you're so, so out of touch with them when there's loads yeah. of them isn't there yeah. and it's just an absolute mush and you can't really see past this if it's, especially if it's indoors as well uh, you can't really see that far out I've not been yeah. lucky enough to play like a huge festival that's outdoor most of them have been inside like uh, big marquees and stuff yeah, like that yeah. I think like we're talking like eight to ten thousand for the tops, but there's people out there play like hundred thousand people, isn't there? On wow. out outdoor and it, you can't actually see where it ends. Nope. I've never had that opportunity. So I don't know how I'd feel about Might that. Be coming. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's it, you know, it's it it's sad, isn't it, when we when we keep ourselves in that little box when we say, Oh, I might like to do that, but no. And, we, and yeah. we let the fear win. We give the fear the power. We don't want to give the fear the power. We, you know, the fear is not our enemy, but we, but we don't want to give it the power over our lives, you know. And it can be quite beautiful living life outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. It, it really is. And, you know, we've got to stop listening to the body's signals as much, you know, when it comes to fear. Because the body fires off it's like an alarm system if we've got beliefs about ourselves that are not in alignment with what we're about to do so for example giving a big talk um and we've got that like i said before you know my inner child going oh my god i'm not worthy of attention whatever it is or i'm i'm scared to be seen as a big one of my inner child my body fires off like this alarm warning warning system so we have to get very, very smart about communicating with the body as well. So so this work around like healing trauma or healing our mental health, we call it mental health, but 
what the mental health system has been missing for many, many years, I believe, is adequate training on supporting people to communicate with their bodies that they're a safe place. Mm. Because if we've got our body firing off an alarm system, it doesn't matter what we say in our head. You know, it's a beautiful place to start. And when we get further down the line, we can listen to our thought system. But really, we have to learn also techniques and tools to turn that alarm off. We need the burglar alarm code, okay, to say to say it's okay, you can calm. So part of the mental health recovery work will always be around nervous system regulation education. I'm yeah. rapping again. Yeah. <laughs> nervous system regulation <laughs> education. Uh, you know, so so we have to balance that work that we do that we do from within. Yeah, there's um, it, it, it's definitely heading in the right direction. The support, but it's not for me. It's not fast enough. No, um, we want acceleration in the mental health system. Yeah, it's not fast enough. The waiting lists aren't fast enough either. The mental health system at the moment is on its knees in this country in complete crisis, and sadly, the highest cause of death in men under forty five at the moment is suicide. We're yeah. not talking about saving money, government, if you're listening, which they won't. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we're not talking about saving money. We're talking about saving lives. And and what's what's going on at the moment in the mental health system is is, is horrifying, actually. You know, the way that, that um, we do not have adequate access to effective mental health treatments in this country as much. And so that what we're trying to do through HEROES is really roll out more of a holistic approach. Uh, we will do it. I, I I don't doubt it. In some way, we you know we're already infiltrating that system, but I, I, that's my mission in this life. You know, I want to be able to support the healing of as many people as possible, and I believe that everyone is entitled to emotional health support. And sadly, that's not happening at the moment. No. But but you know, rather than you know, if we get riled up with loads of anger about this, you know, I. I, I turn it into passion to try and change the system more. But instead of like, if you are on one of these waiting lists or you don't have adequate mental health support, you you know, you're trying to get NHS mental health support and you can't afford to go private, etc. What I would say is there is so much work you can do on yourself. Again, we're looking at the idea that the external world, the stuff around us, the life circumstances, the situation doesn't need to change before we decide to change ourselves. There is so much work we can do on ourselves, you know, and and for me, the most powerful work that I've done, you know, therapy can be great, you know, I found it re-traumatizing in some ways, in all honesty, many times. Obviously, we, digging things up that have already been buried. Uh, exactly, <laughs> buried for a reason a lot of the time, you know, but so therapy can be great, beautiful, it's great for us to access support with our healing journey, actually essential for a lot of people, fantastic whatever however the majority the bulk of the work that we do will be on ourselves there are so many different like you said before the the world is rife with there's podcasts on healing there's motivational speakers all over youtube there are experts on trauma teaching there are books on spiritual healing holistic practices you know we can get the education the education is at our fingertips and i promise you that if you start to learn about how to regulate your body and your mind you can change so if you are on one of those waiting lists yes it's anger provoking but really try and shift and go okay is there something else I can be doing? Again, we're looking through that lens of love instead of the lens of fear. What can I be doing in this situation? And everybody has the capacity for change. Recovery is always possible. It does not mean if it doesn't matter if you are on your knees right now, suicidal, feeling like you have no place to go and there's no hope. It does not matter. I promise, I, I don't mean it doesn't matter that, that you're going through that, mm. but I mean, it, it, it does not mean you cannot recover. It does not mean that you cannot recover, uh, you know, and actually some of the most dramatic transformations that I've seen work with thousands of page, patients over the years and some of the most dramatic transformations that I've seen and the quickest transformations I've seen, I want to make it very clear, qu quickest transformations are people who have the most pain, the most trauma, been through horrific stuff because they've simply got more opportunities for practice. They're triggered more. And then they start to frame those triggers as an opportunity for healing and that, that they can come on leaps and bounds. So it doesn't matter like if, if you're saying to yourself, but I've just been through so much. It's just been so much. Yes, honor that in yourself, but recognize that there's far more power in you than what your past dictates, that you're not 
a product of your past. That's not you. There's things that happened that we can't change. But right now, we all have the, the power to recover from uh, mental health difficulties, no matter where we're at in this life. Yeah. I think um, there's a lot of people when they they are on those waiting lists and because they, they, don't, they don't know what to do, they, they're they almost looking for some kind of solution in the wrong places, whether yes. it be drink or substances or, yes. or they're going on social media and that, that's probably, I think, one of the worst things you could do because they, they're thinking, I'll try and find something on the internet that's going to make me happy, whether it be something funny or an opportunity, but then all they're doing is... They're either doom scrolling because there's yes. so much going on in the world that's put on the internet that you don't see on the news, or there's things that they may be just comparing themselves to an old school friend. Oh my God, look at their life compared to mine. Well, mine must be rubbish. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with me? Why have I not got this? Why have I not got that partner or that car, that house, yes. that job? Why am I not on ten holidays or whatever it might be? Yeah. And it and it it just adds on to what is already going on in the mind. Um, and we feed those belief systems as well. If we have that belief system to start with, the the actions that we take from that place, again, making choices from that place of identity and what we believe about ourselves. And and those choices that we make feed the feeling. Yeah. It, it, so it is like a cycle. So when we change ourselves, we start making new choices, which feeds a different cycle, a new pathway in the brain. And, you know, we can make our social media. I had a massive social media uh, cull um, and my social media now, when I go on my Instagram, it is the most educational, inspirational, motivational, rapping again, mm. I'm rapping again, oh, yeah. but it is the most therapeutic space for me. Well, not the most, not the most, but it's, mm. it's incredibly therapeutic for me. When I go on my Instagram newsfeed, it's filled with educators it's filled with motivational speakers it's filled with people that are living a life that's on my vision board it's filled with uh you know beautiful education on how i can support my own healing it's it's filled with people who are doing amazing things in the world and it's healthy yeah there is such thing as a healthy news feed and we we are the curators of that you know if there's stuff that repeatedly is make us feel bad a you know, we can look at it and go, okay, is there something in me that needs changing here? Am I comparing myself? Do I need to work on this and sell and learn to celebrate other people's successes instead of, uh, you know, get down on myself? There might be a beautiful learning opportunity in that, Mm. you know, when we're scrolling and we're noticing difficult feelings come up. Or sometimes it's just like, oh my God, this is bad energy. I don't want this. Every post here is just not, and we can curate our own newsfeed follow and follow you know uh i've, I've found uh it, it just ticked something in my mind when you were talking about it um i know that facebook and instagram are the same company yeah. and i find instagram so much easier to control for the <laughs> content i want to see Me too. because i can scroll through my instagram and it's just going to be dogs <laughs> mu- music music related things musicians nice you know just yeah. things like that anything that i'm interested in um the ocean even though it terrifies me but i'm fascinated at the same time yeah, yeah. just things like that and then i'll follow all those things on facebook but, but for some reason not enough dogs ev- no but <laughs> <laughs> for some reason all these other things appear in your news feed and you can yeah. you can unfollow and hide you know you know constantly but more keep appearing whether it be some I don't know, some kind of animal cruelty or something really horrible happening or people yeah, arguing. I'm like, that? why does this stuff appear in my <laughs> news feed? And, yeah. and and it just keeps coming up. You know, it might be and it and it's and it's you can be you could I could be following a I don't know, like a, a music equipment group for Yorkshire because I might want to buy something. And someone's posted a video of a I don't know, someone hitting an animal or something. I'm like, why why is that even in Absolutely, there? Absolutely, yeah. And and but that's that doesn't happen on Instagram. It doesn't. I find Instagram a way nicer place. I don't yeah. really I don't ever scroll on Facebook anymore. No. I, I, I scroll for Instagram. I love it. I, I was love thinking my Instagram about it then because I come off of Facebook for a little while, um and just just like had a little breather from it. I didn't announce it because everyone likes to do that, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. I am leaving I'm social media. I'm coming on Facebook. What they're wanting everyone to cry, and yeah. <laughs> I just just deactivated it for about I think about a year or something like wow. that, and just had just had Instagram, and it was such a 
calmer place. You didn't see drama. You didn't see people yeah. arguing. You didn't see all these horrible things that keep coming up. Um, I've, I've had to put it back on again because I feel like it's a necessary evil, especially as a it musician. Is. When you when you uh, are creating stuff in the world that you want to release, uh, you, you can really just frame the social networks as that they're a great platform for communicating with people aren't they yeah but it but it is challenging that you've got to deal with the news feed as well in that uh, yeah yeah you can't just you can't be a passive participant in it can I you? try not to scroll on Facebook I but don't it, scroll on Facebook it, anymore really. every now and then it just happens yeah and it's usually from um because they've got reels and things like that, and obviously they they kind of just popping up as a recommendation. Just I always get like Taylor Swift reels, and I'm like, I've never mentioned that <laughs> anywhere on the internet. But I, I don't know. That's my repeated pattern on Facebook. Taylor there's, Swift. There's reels. the most bizarre things it's not appear. Bad. They're, they're, they're yeah. random. It's like one minute there's I don't know someone in a in a Mustang pulling out of a car meet and crashing into a lamppost. And I think what's that got to do with anything? I've just been watching. I've just <laughs> I've just been watching a slap bass tutorial. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got some guy who's building some kind of shelter in the ground in the middle of the forest out of oh, well, bits that of bits quite of good. They're fascinating. I'll sometimes I'm watching them at three in the morning thinking, what am I doing? I love a nice grand design. Yeah. yeah. I've got this place. I don't I don't It's great. <laughs> this is a grand design. This studio is a grand design, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I I don't I don't think I'd be able to do it with the tools that he had, though. Yeah. Literally, <laughs> literally a few pocket a tools. Yeah, a little pocket knife and and there's some kind of fold-out hammer and he's just created See, a house. See, that's inspiring. Oh, it's Stuff amazing. like that is pretty cool, isn't it? Inspiring. Yeah. Like. It's like we've you think, well, we've come a long way and we've got all this you know, in, in industrial equipment where we can make all these things and some of these amazing buildings around the world, but you still got two hands and people can just get hold of whatever they used to use back in the day <laughs> and create some kind of shelter. This, and it's, this it, is it. And this goes back to that stuff around, like, we have to sometimes make do with what we've got and we can still get the same result, if not a better result. You know, like, if we are on, wait, we're waiting for someone to save us on, from the mental health system, we can't get the support we need, whatever. What can we do with our own two hands? What can we do? What can we resource from within? What are the tools that we can research ourselves? You know, it's hard from a place of depression. Yeah. I want to honour that. It's very hard. But it's like the stuff that we can do, like this guy's building a house with a bloody pocket tool kind of yeah. thing. And w what can we resource from within? We're, we're magnificent beings in that way. We're very resourceful as human beings. You know, yeah. we, have a ve we have a strong survive uh, uh, drive, a drive to survive. It's just all these rhyming raps that just keep coming out. So drive to survive. We're going to walk out of here with chains. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> pump up trainers, snap back to the side. Oh, God. Yeah. But, you know, so, you know, resourcing, we, we, we all have capacity to do that. And, you know, if we have got severe depression or something, it feels like too much effort. Set yourself a challenge one minute. One minute a day, I'm going to watch one minute of this motivational talk on personal growth on YouTube, wh whatever it is. That yeah. You can t put your timer on your phone. I'm going to force myself to watch this minute. And then maybe next week, you'll start watching three minutes. And this is the way we do it. Step by step, we, we build that house in the forest yeah. with the pocket tools. Step by step, we build our way back to wholeness. You don't have to do it all at once. And that's the glory of it. We've got plenty of time. Society also tells us time's running out. Oh my God, it's too late in my life. Oh my God, it's, oh no, it's getting late. I can't believe it. It's like Eckhart Tolle, one of, one of the greatest authors of all time, in my opinion, uh, you know, works with Oprah Winfrey now. He, sell, he sold out Royal Albert, Royal Albert Hall within minutes a, a few months ago. Is it in his late 70s? He didn't write his first book till he was 49. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's just one example of someone that I love. There's millions yeah. of examples like that. Yeah. Time is not running out. Please stop telling yourself time is running out because the more we tell ourselves time is running out, we're again in that lack mentality, which is not an energy that's expansive in this life. You know, really just recognize that that anything is possible with that right energy and the lack mentality energy is not the correct energy yeah. that's ripe for the picking for the things we want to achieve in our life. Time is not running out. What do you know now that you didn't when you were in your 20s? What do you know now that you didn't when you were 16? How do you feel now about you that you didn't when you were younger? You know, what can you bring through? How can you embrace aging? You know, I'm very anti, anti-aging. I think it's extremely damaging for people. 
I'm, I'm extremely anti the anti-aging movement, not only just for looks, which is obviously a whole topic into itself, but I think the way that it damages people, because the one thing we are guaranteed to do in this life as we live is age. Yeah. If we are in resistance to that, we are absolutely fucked. <laughs> yeah. We're completely screwed mentally. We can't we can't live in an embracing, surrendered, positive energy if we feel that. So we have to let go of that. You know, I'm about to turn 40 in March. I'm really, really excited about it. And it's so funny because I remember when I turned 30. You've got the same 30. birthday as me as well. You're joking? 16th. Of March? Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> That's so insane. Are you going to be 39? Uh, 38. 38. I did have to get reminded in the summer, though, because I thought I was a year younger than I was. And I... It happens. Yeah. I mean, am I really 40? I don't know. Maybe I'm already 40. Yeah. I, I was know. having a conversation, you track. a conversation with a guy I knew at a festival, and I was telling him I was 36, and my wife was like, no, you're 37. <laughs> like, am I? <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, then. That's brilliant. I thought, I'm a, I've got to believe her, because she's always right. You I'm lose there. track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a good man. You've learned, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because it's like when, I guess when I was turning 30, I was like seeing it as some like, oh my God, I'm like officially old. Yep. There'll be no opportunities for me anymore. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm past it. I'm over the hill. And now I'm 40. I'm going into it going, come on life, show yeah. me what more is in store. Because I, I <sighs> used to be like 20 and seeing people turn 40. And in my mind, that was like, old and yeah. and they go life starts at 40 and i used to think you are talking absolute crap to justify yeah. the fact that you're not cool anymore yeah. and as i've as i've got older i'm approaching it i'm like i'm so looking forward to it life's much better you know i'm not i'm it's Great. it's it's not it's not chaos you know I'm, I'm in a much more stable position mentally financially yes. there's opportunities that yes. are there now that were never there before because i've done things that have justified me getting those opportunities yeah um i'd like to say i'm a little bit wiser hell yeah <laughs> so yeah there's there's things that i i approach in a different way to Beautiful. when i was younger and i'm now like i think i put a post on like facebook or instagram at christmas and i was like i'm just embracing getting older now like i got i I've, i hated turning 30 um me too. i think i was uh I think it was around the time when I started working with children in care and you think you're young still at 30. Spend some time around teenagers. <laughs> you are not young cool anymore. No. Not even if you're rapping. I've got no idea what they're saying. <laughs> they 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 were especially at that time because they like all um like grime music had just come in and they were just this like mumble rap and they were speaking in ways that I like what are they on about? Cause, uh, <laughs> like, like, Rhyme like music. when we were kids, and <laughs> and and we'd say things like, "Oh, that's bad," or "That's wicked," and and adults would go, "Does that mean it's good then?" And yeah. we're like, "Yeah, you're square." <laughs> <laughs> and like now, there's new words, and we've got no idea. And, it's, oh, yeah. and I'm like, I'm just very comfortable in the fact that like I've I've reaching level thirty eight because I think, well, the alternative's not too great, is it? So I would hell yeah, <laughs> I would rather be some old wrinkly if I can at some point and. And and I am I'm 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 excited about it and looking forward to it because I I don't see it as oh god I can't do the things that I used to do anymore I don't want to do those things I don't want to queue at a nightclub at two in the morning and oh, no. get the last train or or the or the first train oh, in the morning on a Saturday love, yeah I'd, I want I'm looking forward to thinking well I could do this in that time I could visit that country or travel yes. here I could record this we could try for this type of opportunity musically I can the same with this podcast you know I I wanted to do this for a long time yeah. and, I th and I thought I'm just I need to just start because you can start late I it's had uh, beautiful. I had uh, I, I, when I when I first kind of started uh recording them like, like late, late last year like properly in here um uh, I was like posting them into podcast groups and guys were commenting, going, oh, your studio looks great. I, I, I wish I had that. I, I'm going to save up and then I'm going to start. No, don't save up. Start it now. Yes. Because you could just get I'll a... I'll do it when. Is yeah. it, one of the most crippling sentences we can say to ourselves, if we want to achieve something, is, I will do it when this happens. Yeah. When that happens, I'll start to take action. Nope, nope, nope. The man in the forest that you just spoke about created a house with a pocket tool. Yeah. Do you know it's like yeah they don't they don't start they don't start. need 
all the equipment and all the nope. the money thrown into this little building I've got. It's they they may be able to just use a smartphone. And, and it might be a room in the house. It, it might be a cupboard in the house yeah. that they transform up. Box room, smartphone, potentially creating far better content than I could create with all the toys I've got in here. Yes. And, you know, because it's not about the toys. It's about it's about the people on the end of the microphone, isn't it? So. Absolutely. And and th- there's a, th- I'm bringing through lots of quotes as well. There's a lot of themes coming through today, the quotes and the rapping. Oh, I'll be writing these yeah. down when I'm editing. <laughs> But there's an amazing quote, which is a Rumi quote. Rumi's like a Sufi poet, and he just comes out with the most poignant quotes. And he said, as you walk on the way, the way will appear. So so it's not that we, you know, we're looking for the way to appear so much of the time in this life. Oh, when when is it going to happen? You know, when am I going to be off this waiting list to get the mental health support, whatever, whatever it is? Where is the way? And it's like, okay, if we start, the way will appear. Stuff starts to envelop as we just take the action. And it's trusting in that. And I've seen that so much in my own life, you know, doing things that have really, really scared me or just taking that little bit of action, even when it's been really, really hard. Then things start to unfold. Another opportunity comes up because I'm because I'm walking on that way, because I'm doing that. But if you never start, you know, I, we're not going to see that. We're not going to see that path appear. And it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, uh, I, I did, I, I, I met this woman, this incredible woman called Rachel Peru, who's a model. She works with like bridge models. She does like Marks and Spencer's campaigns, big modeling. She started modeling when she was like 45 or 46. Yeah. She's, she's got her own podcast. She's doing a She's blasting out this life after a life doing a completely different career. We can change careers midlife. We can change careers in our 70s. You know, we could, it doesn't matter where you are at in your life. Age, it is just a number. The time is a bit of an illusion here. Wherever you are, start. Do not look back and go, oh, if only I'd have started when I was 30. It's okay. Yeah. Forgive yourself. You weren't ready. It's okay. Be kind to yourself in this moment. You can start now. Doesn't matter what career you're in. You might be unsatisfied in your career. Well, I'll tell you what, there's something that you're here to do more. There's something that you've got purpose for more in this life if you're feeling stuck in your career. You know, a beautiful way to reframe the idea of that I'm stuck, I'm trapped, you know, which is something that's so common for people. They feel stuck or trapped in their lives. A beautiful way to reframe that is like, okay, this feeling in me is just showing up how ready for change I am. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. The energy of that is so different to the energy of I am stuck. I am stuck. I am trapped. We're in that cycle. We're in that fear-based belief system. The exact same situation, I feel ready for change here. I'm ready for growth. I'm ready for expansion. See how the external situation doesn't need to change for us to change our minds. We're not waiting for something to change in the external. And then we change our minds and go, okay, well, I'm ready for growth now. We go, okay, I'm having this feeling. What is it signifying to me? How can I choose to change my mind in this moment? And we all have the power. And I know it's hard when we're going through really difficult mental health struggles, but we all have the power to reframe in that moment and yeah. shift the energy into the energy of expansion, which is where we're at. That's where we're at our happiest as human beings. Evolution, change. We're not here to live a life like this. Yeah. We're here to grow and change, do new things. It doesn't matter what your age is. I meet a lot of people at, at shows, um, and they'll, they'll, especially if they're a bit older than me, and they'll go, oh, I wish I'd learned to play a guitar, or I wish I'd learned to do this, blah, blah, blah. And I think, I just say, well, do it. Oh, no, it's too late for me now. Too late for what? You know, what? what if you want to play guitar yes. in your bedroom, or you decide you might want to meet up with five friends and play some songs in a pub corner or, you know, yes. get started and you it might grow into something further if you it. want it to. And we need more of that in this yeah. life because we do have, like we said before, this youth obsessed culture, which is very, very damaging for people, this anti-aging movement. And so you'd be doing the world a favor if you're in your 60s and you feel like you want to start a band, you've never picked up a guitar in your life. Should I tell you what, you getting out onto that stage will in- inspire other people. You'll not only be in your joy and in more in your purpose, but it's like, we need that. We need more older role models in this life. Yeah. Share it, talk about it, 
post on your social media, you know, actually I'm picking up the guitar for the first time today, I'm 65. Whatever yeah. it is, whatever it is that you're doing, share it. You know, you can be this beacon of inspiration. We all have that capacity to do that. Um, and, and we need more older role models in this world. We need more of that in the mainstream media. We need older voices represented. We need that wisdom represented. We need the experience represented. There are plenty of wise young people, of course, of course, honoring that completely you know some incredible you know, teachers out there musicians who are young obviously etc but but the depth of experience what that brings yeah incomparable I it's incomparable when, yeah when you talk about you know the the very uh, knowledgeable say 20 year olds yeah they they might be saying all the right words but when you compare them to someone who's 80 of sound mind that's lived through so much including that 20 years that that this younger person's lived that you know that in, when when that twenty year old turns forty, their views are probably going to be quite different Extremely. from when they were twenty. Uh, same when you get to sixty and eighty, and when there's a lot of people I talk to, when uh, I've spent most of my time around people a lot older than me. A lot of my friends have always been a lot older than me because uh, I find them fascinating, and yeah. they've they've done things that I wish I'd done. And yeah, and you you. you they they've also they also do things that you would never have thought to have done, and you yeah. go. Actually, that, yeah. I'd love to do that. That sounds amazing. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot of people have this mindset that, like, when they hit 40, their life is over. They give up. Mm. I've seen it so many times. So many middle-aged people come to the Heroes groups. You know, people in the 50s would get, to be honest, I'd say probably the majority of people who come through the Heroes program are 40, in the 40s and 50s, they're in that place where they're feeling stuck, but really they're just ready for change. That yeah. They have got that little willingness within them to change. And, you know, the same story again and again, I've given up. And it's like, oh my God, you've possibly got another 40 years on this earth, man. Yeah. You've possibly got another 40 years, even if you've only got another 10 years. Let's live it right. Let's do it right. We, we don't want to just give up on life and, and let ourselves go. There's that turn of phrase like, oh my God, they've really let themselves go. Well, we're not just talking about that on a physical perspective. When we talk about people's looks, don't we? We live, let themselves yeah. go. We let ourselves go when we ignore the truth of who we are. We let ourselves go when we follow that fear-based belief system. And we let ourselves go when we let society dictate to us what age is acceptable to do what we really want to do in this life. Um, and we let ourselves go when we forget our capacity for change and our power and our purpose and our limitlessness as human beings. That's letting ourselves go because we're, we're taking the authentic truth of who we are, like we said before, that higher self that, that's within us at all moments. We're taking that and we're throwing it under the bus. And are you going to be happy? I can tell you, you won't be happy. It's a, that's a one-way one, one street to misery. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it really is. Bring yourself back. Don't let yourself go. The older you get, bring yourself back. Keep integrating, you know, and keep showing up in this world as you. Yeah. When I talked about the uh, feeling like a, almost like a rebirth a, f a few years back, a lot of the things that uh, I started doing were things that I used to do when I was younger, but the good things that made me happy and the things that I felt like gave me some kind of development, some progression in life. Yeah. Um and and just basically just filtered out all the bad habits because I'd I'd highlighted them sometimes myself and sometimes because I'd seen other people had highlighted them to me and things like that. But now I feel like I can move forward uh, and and enjoy things for what they are rather Gorgeous, than yeah. having all those distractions or those those negative feelings. And obviously, I'm not saying that they never just appear because they do. Things appear, you know. I can, I can make St myself stuff happens that's out of our control. Sometimes, oh yeah. doesn't it? And I and I I can get to a point where sometimes I'll try and do too much or whatever, and it makes me start getting a bit stressed, and my brain's all a bit bit like a whirlwind, and and it'll affect things like my sleep or my diet, yeah. which yeah. I try not to let those fall in 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 uh in you know just just as a, as a kind of the basic aspects of my life i need to make sure that i'm doing all the right things you know that was ticking those boxes the physical stuff yeah your body as well. because because it is it, it will all have a bit of a dramatic knock-on effect and i think well if i can if i can keep making sure that i if i do steer off the path a little i can get back on again and then i can continue doing what i'm doing um and then like you say there's a lot of people they've, they've they do get distracted and they just 
they never never quite get back to where they want to be and they never continue on that path, whether it might be a, a career they wanted or they wanted to go traveling or yeah. they wanted to, I don't know, have a, some kind of project, whatever it might be. And they, they've never done it because they've just let life steer them off it's somewhere so else. And, and it lets the world down, unfortunately, as well. You know, it's like, it's not even just for you to do it. It's like, you know, if you're living life in your authentic truth, you've just got so much more to give to this world. You know, yeah. it's how we heal the world. You know, the more of us that rise up and, and live more in our purpose, it's, you know, it's an incredible place to live from. Can I just ask you a question? Yes. You know, when you went through this like rebirth, it's sort of like an awakening, like you're describing. Yeah. What was the catalyst for that? Um, I would say probably identifying the relationship I was in at the time breaking down, uh, and their behavior being very similar to my kind of toxic behavior, leaving another relationship, a relationship like the one, the one I was in before I, I kind of realized I wanted out, but felt stuck. So I'd just basically do whatever I could in, within my power to try and destroy it. Um, wow, yeah, the saboteur. saboteur. Uh, yeah, um, rather than just being having the balls to just go, I'm off. I would oh, try and this resonates. For yeah, me. I would try and just completely just break it down uh, and think that maybe it'll just it'll just kind of you know that limb will break off naturally and go away, and uh, and it became really messy. And I think they seemed to be doing the same thing to me, and I was like. Hang on a minute. And they were a bit younger than me as well. And I thought, I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> and I just thought, I don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've come into this feeling as a better, a better person, a fresh start from when I was younger. And then I thought, no, I don't, I don't need this. And I was already kind of, um, I'd already kind of started writing little bits towards for that book. Um, uh, I'd, I'd been reading a lot more about things of similar subject um, and just trying to just, what how I could only describe is just get better. Um, Amazing. In, so your ma main focus had become like change and getting better. Yeah. Um, above all else. I had, and I, yeah. had, I was like focusing deeply on the things I was doing musically, uh, another career. I was, I was doing some studying alongside and things like that and, uh, uh, and going to like, um, just after, I think it was, I can't remember if it was that afternoon class at a, at a college, just once a week for something, uh, just trying to improve myself in every way. Uh, and then I thought, well, they're, they're not putting into this relationship what I'm putting in. And then I, I could start kind of seeing, well, I had suspicions that there may have been an overlap between me and the next person and, right. and, and there was. <laughs> uh, and, and I thought, well, I'll just shove it away. Job done. That's it. Um, which I think they thought I might put up more of a fight, and they seemed to be angry about that. Yeah. <laughs> which I found really bizarre, and I thought, <laughs> if you don't, if you, if you want rid of me, <laughs> why are you angry that I'm going faster? So yeah. I just went, um, amazing, and I just started a fresh start. And but I, it was weird because I said, I, "Well, I'm never going near another woman again for years, and this and that, and blah blah blah." Uh, and two weeks later, I crossed paths with Libby, and we oh, we used to see each other when we were amazing. teenagers. Um, and we 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 kind of like drifted apart. She was busy in a girl band, and I was doing all my stuff, and we and nothing ever went, you know, anywhere. And uh, at the time, I was like, oh, absolutely gutted. And I always thought for years, I was like, what, like what, what if? <laughs> and then uh, and then we just crossed paths, and it just literally just felt natural as hell. And she's been amazing for for my kind of uh, well being. I mean, in, even in the time we've been together, we've. Uh, you know, we've, we've achieved loads. We've gone through some real awful things in terms of like losing family members. We've, you know, I think I've, I think I've had two or I think I've lost two kind of big people in my family. And even in the coming up to six years that we've been together, um, she, and she lost someone in her family. We'd lost some friends and all that type of stuff. And we've been really supportive. We've been out, we've been traveling, we've done all sorts of stuff. We got this little house together and built this studio and all that type of stuff, and we've just kept rolling with it. And she's a singer as well, so we both sing so together. Gorgeous, yeah. um, she tries to kick me into shape, like fitness wise, because I don't always look after myself. I've got this weird thing where I'll. It's almost I, I, the the doctors never said it was ADHD when I was a kid, but I, I'm I'm convinced I should go back because 
I'll get into something and I will throw everything myself physically, mentally. I'll worry about it. I'll throw money at it. Yeah, and that's what I that's what I describe it as. But it's not actually officially been diagnosed to me, so I don't know. But I, when I get rolling with something, I'm all or nothing. Um, yeah, and and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it also. I can drain myself physically yes. and mentally doing it because I'll... It's taking all your energy that, yeah. Yeah, and then sometimes I'll create, uh, it might be bands, it might be projects, it could be anything at all. I'll create multiple... Oh, uh, yes. Multiple, <laughs> like, the, uh, like, projects. I know that one. And I try to give them all the same level of attention and completely just wipe myself out. Yeah. Um, she has to kind of, like, you know, just... just Remind Choose one me. thing and do that really well. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a good ta- a good tactic. One path and do that really well. Yeah, then loads of different things and do them all half ass. But yeah, I mean, going back to uh, that, I think it was just thinking that I'm going to better myself and be how I want to be, and it, it doesn't matter if someone else comes along uh, in that ex partner's place. I'm so just you need jumped to... into the void. It's yeah. like you jumped not having the certainty that there was going to be someone else to catch you but you jumped into like just i was preparing myself like mentally to just plow through life and it doesn't matter if anybody else ever comes along i was like not i'm not bothered i'm not going to go out looking for somebody i've got no one in my sights shall we say at that point whatever um and we just crossed paths it was just it was just really lucky because someone i know was looking for a female singer and I said, oh, I know somebody. I'll, I'll, I don't know what she does anymore, but I know she's a brilliant singer. And I just dropped her a message and asked. And then um, the, they basically questioned uh, if she was still with her ex-partner um, because they'd worked with him and didn't really like him. So. <laughs> and I just said, oh, funny bit of a random question, but they want to know, <laughs> are you still with your ex-partner? And she says, no, not for a long time. And I said, all right. And then oh, we, and so, good time, mate. And then about two weeks after that, we were like just chatting and she came to one of my gigs and, and now she's stuck with me. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. I, I just think that's really important, like what you're bringing through there about relationships, like particularly with like, intimate partnerships, because the partner that we pick is one of the most important choices we're ever going to make in our life. Yeah. Is the partner that we that we spend the most time with, that we're intimate with. That container is either going to suck the life out of us, be very, very incredibly toxic, yeah. or it's going to inspire us and that person's going to inspire us. When we're in the, we're in a container with that person, so it's you know it's either going to poison us or be an antidote for you know hell. Yeah. <laughs> because all all interpersonal relationships they trigger us. It's not easy, is it? Even if you've got an amazing compatible partner, yeah. We st- all our old shit comes up in our partnership, our, our intimate partnerships, don't they? So the person that we choose to do that work with and and our wounds to come up with is so important oh my god it's so important and it's so brave i think we were touching on it before as well it's so brave to end a relationship with no other relationship to go to the way is clear but to end that because you know it's not doing you well even yeah. if you, every your attachment's saying that you want to stay you know i i've done that as well myself recently it's been the most empowering incredible decision i've made for my life I, my, my life has expanded within the space of a couple of months from ending a relationship that was very uh, not nourishing for me anymore yeah see i noticed a difference because i was i was still um working in the care sector at that time and you said yourself you've experienced it you know how difficult it can be and sometimes you don't always leave when you want to leave you nope. don't always have because people think oh well, we're working with kids we're going to be wa- watching harry potter and having cups of tea and playing chess no sometimes you're getting pieces of wood swung at you from round <laughs> corridors and and yeah. and uh, up all night and you've done two or three days sleeping there back to back with oh yeah the sleeping anything. shifts i used to do those and i'd come back and i'd get like aggro from my ex-partner for basically um not being there not being at home like, that is not what you i've need. got a i've got a duty of care i'm not allowed to leave um whereas when I, if that happened when I was still doing it and uh, and Libby had come back to Libby, she'd be really supportive. She'd like have you had planned a, a day? planned have out you... a relaxing kind of day or 
make, she bakes and things like that. So she oh. make me a cake or something like that. You know, she just do Beautiful. little things, and it's it's that it's those little things you do to support each other. You know, like rather than kind of punishing someone for already having a struggle outside of the house you don't your home doesn't have to be a battlefield you don't come back home to then have further arguments Absolutely you've just you've not. just dealt with loads of stress outside yeah. of, you come home to your safe place that's where you put your comfy clothes on yes you put netflix on you get some comfort food and you just do whatever you need you to do want it to, to get feel through. like a very hospitable environment yeah. it's welcoming it's inviting it's warm it's nurturing you want to feel safe in your partnership and i think that like you know you've got to make that decision at some point along the way when you realise if you are in a relationship that's not bringing you that feeling of safety, yeah. it's like you're worth more. Yeah. Whatever your belief about yourself, you are worth more. You are worth feeling safe. And when we make that decision, that's when the good stuff starts happening. Sometimes, you know, when we talk about like this... <clears throat> When we talk about this like action that we want to take to do better things in our life, we take those actions. Sometimes the action can be stopping something. Yeah. So whether it's quitting something or ending a relationship, that can be such a powerful uh, communication to the universe of I'm ready for more. Sometimes we have to learn what we don't want yeah. to get what we do, to figure out what we do and go, actually, I do not want this reflection anymore. I'm worth more. And we end that relationship. We quit that job. We decide against doing something anymore. That's when the miracles start happening because you've communicated with your energy, I want more. I And I'm worthy of more. Not I want more, but I'm stuck. Yeah. I want more. It's very passive. I'm not, I want more, but this is happening to me. We go, I want more and I make a choice in this moment. We might not always be able to control the external situations or circumstances, but we can damn well control what we do about it. We can damn well control the way we feel about it and the way we see it and the way we perceive it. And those big actions that we take, like you say, I mean, it's been a catalyst to change your life, hasn't it? Oh, it's... It, Making that decision to end that it's relationship. It's not only the, my surroundings are different, it's made me completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of people that think I'm an arsehole, but I I feel like I'm such a, who be cares? a better person than I was. <laughs> Quite frankly, who cares? Yeah, um, <laughs> I've mentioned this in, in uh, previous episodes. There's people who describe me as an arsehole I've never actually met before, just based what on... What an some, honour. Yeah, and I think, well, yeah. Some <laughs> you must be doing something some right. People, yeah, <laughs> some, people, <laughs> some people have to work really hard and, you know, do things to people to be called an arsehole, but I, I sometimes can achieve it without even uh, oh, <laughs> being what around a, What a skill. <laughs> what a valuable life skill. Yeah, well, well, at least I'm making some kind of impact in, yeah. in the world, you know. <laughs> at least you're making your mark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Our souls will do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to end it there. So I always like to end it on something. Uh, not, that on I've been, souls, not on our souls. Not on our souls, no. No, it's not the best end, is it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> I always like to ask uh, my guests uh, what advice they would give to their younger self oh, based on what you know right wow. now. What advice I would give to my younger self is recognise that the beliefs you've created about yourself are not true. Recognize that you have the power to change those beliefs and then change your life. You got the power. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I would say, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, because we've... Oh, yeah definitely wish that I'd done that <laughs> yeah yeah this is it isn't it never too old to learn but you know sometimes we do only learn when we when we get a bit wiser um and we really want to go in that direction you know the, it's never too old to learn and and that advice we can give to ourselves it'll be interesting the advice we would give to our 40 year old selves when we're 60 yeah we'll do this podcast again in 20 years like what, what <laughs> advice would you give to yourself then <laughs> stop rapping <laughs> <laughs> you may have had a, a, a very successful career from now till then because, you say, like you say, it's never too late. I might set a goldy looking chain cover band or something <laughs> like that. Just you said the gold chains oh, before. It's weird that you mentioned them because I've not heard anything about them for years. Uh, 
and I'm and I'm not even joking. I'll show you after this after this finishes. I've got a tab open on my phone because I'm like, oh my god, what? they're touring. <laughs> and I was like, what? And I was like, they're so terrible. But I just I feel like I want to go. <laughs> Maybe you should ask to support them. Maybe it's a sign. Well, yeah, I've, I've definitely got content from this episode. Yeah. <laughs> Got me rhymes. You've got all the lyrics <laughs> sorted already. <laughs> oh, maybe not. But you know, <laughs> well, thank you very much. I feel like I've learnt so much. Not just me um, too. not just about um, everything that you do, but I feel like I'm throughout it. I was kind of just revisiting moments in my life that I could relate to what you were talking about, and I feel like I've learnt a lot about myself. Beautiful. Oh, that's gorgeous to hear. Yeah, and me too. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure. Thanks so but much. Yeah, for if me. Uh, like we said, if you if you want to come back at some point and you've uh, got your rap costume on, feel, <laughs> feel free. I'll get my shell suit out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, um, Any excuse. I'm sure I could put some kind of um, scented incense going on there, so it's it's like so it feels like Snoop Dogg's in the room. <laughs> Some special oh, kind gosh, of grass. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> I would love that. Well, thank you very much. And I'll see you, you very so soon. Much. Cheers Thanks then. Thanks so much, Matt.